But will she, but will she comment this time? Yes, we would like to welcome you to a uh, work session. Today is Tuesday for the music for the municipal council. Today is Tuesday, May twenty second, two o five p.m. Um, we are convened in the city center conference room at three fifty one West Center Street in Provo. This meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube. Provo City Council it will also be available for on demand viewing. Please be aware that the microphones in the room pick up noise or paper and other rustling objects. Further, be aware that microphones can pick up side conversations. We will begin this meeting with a roll call and then we will have Dave Harding give our opening prayer. Let's track it. James Nagg, Kate Andrew, Dave Sewell, Elizabeth Vanderlifting, Gary Witterton, David Harding, Bryce Bumford, Kelsey Zarbach, George Hanley. Okay. Father in heaven, we are too grateful for the opportunity to gather together to discuss the proposed budget for the city of Provo. We ask thee to bless those who are presenting that they, will, that they may be able to uh, speak articulately to what is proposed and they'll be able to answer the questions that may arise. So I'll ask for by guidance and inspiration as we consider the questions that we need to decide on this budget. And ask for a blessing upon uh, residents of Provo and ask thee to um, consecrate the efforts of the leaders, the employees of the city to be for the Good of those we serve. Just we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And we welcome George Stewart. And before we begin with the agenda, I would like to remind those in attendance that although this is a public meeting, only the presenters and those seated at the council table may ask, may speak, or ask questions unless otherwise directed. We will begin with item number one, a presentation by public works staff on topics related to the budget. And if we'll introduce our Sorry. subjects all the way through there. All the way through. Yeah. So our intent, come on up, Dave. So our intent is to uh, frame for your for your information, but also for the visual and audio records um, what we've asked. Our as as the staff went through the various budget requests and, and the budget book. Uh, what we tried to identify is those departments that had supplemental requests, those that had any new programs or issues that we knew the council was interested in, fee, fees or utility rate increases, um, those kinds of, that kind of information to bring to you. So the first one, of course, is public works. We've asked public works to talk about recycling fees and their sanitation update. And I understand they're going to go into composting a little bit. Um, they have continuing the significant utility rate increases, and they have some supplemental uh, supplemental requests um, uh, that were some were funded, some weren't. We wanted you to have that opportunity to talk to. What we're anticipating from this is that there's no implied motions in any of this today. Um, if you have directions, if you have input to give to the administration. Um, you know, feel free to make motions on whatever you, you feel as we go through all these various subjects today. But um, we've asked, we, 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 we want you to consider whether in this one, to whether to increase recycling rates, whether to approve utility rate increases, and uh, what you feel about the supplemental requests that they've made. Off to you. That's great. Thank you very much, Cliff. Thanks for that introduction. And, and also thank you to the council. Uh, for the invitation to come and talk with the budget and and we'll uh, move through a number of items very quickly here and uh, try to keep you on schedule for a, a potentially long afternoon on budget with a lot of numbers so I, uh, before I start I, I I want to make sure that I recognize and uh, express my appreciation to Jimmy McKnight uh, Jimmy's sitting in the back and he does um, a huge majority of our budget work uh, this starts clear back in January for much of the staff and and uh, he's heavily involved for 
you know, six months of the year, um, just this is primary duty. And uh, he, he spends quite a bit of time on this along with the division directors. And I want to express my appreciation to, to him and, and the uh, effort he makes in the budget and, and throughout the operations and, and public works. We were asked, as, as Cliff indicated, we were asked to give a couple of uh, very quick updates. We have just a little bit of information. Um, about a year, almost two years ago now, we started uh, the composting operation, took it over from uh, South Utah Valley uh, Waste District uh, because of uh, some, some issues that were developing there and uh, took it over and just wanted to make sure that the council knew where we were at. Um, this year, this we've had one full year basically of operation. Uh, the previous year, we were kind of in the middle of the year when we took it over and we didn't really have uh, full operation going um, just because of the timing of the year. But um, uh, uh, Bryce Rolf uh, is sitting in the back. He's our sanitation manager. This is one of the key areas that he oversees. And uh, just reporting as far as um, revenue, uh, the material that we have, um, we've, we've got ample material. And you may recall one of the specific goals in our composting operation is not to landfill the material because we're going to get charged a higher price. And we have we've succeeded. We've done that for two seasons now where we have not landfilled any material. So it's being sold out and it's a relatively low price. It's still, you know, we have quite a, um, a very uh, low price, but that's one of the objectives is to get rid of the material. And so we continue to do that. And uh, and so uh, it's it's kept the, the green waste program uh, on a very good track. Composting itself um, this is not green waste, uh, just the composting operation itself is generating about $13,000 a year. It's not a lot. We charge, I believe it's still $5 for drop off. I think we're up to, is it $3 for, um, what is it, a two yard scoop? Is that what it is? One yard scoop. So again, relatively low prices. We still operate composting. It's available uh, to the residents at the old man field, but it's still limited. It's not open all week long. It's I think it is it just Friday as in Saturday still, Bryce? Yes, except for June. Yeah, we open it up spring and fall. We open it up all week, um, uh, the entire spring and fall cleanup. But generally during the year, it's just Fridays and Saturdays. Seems to be relatively good, um, you know, as far as the operation. We do get requests, though, from time to time to expand those hours, uh, some, some changes. And again, we'll look to the council if you want to have some conversation about operations. Um, we're, we're happy to to have some additional uh, conversation but this we just took a few pictures as far as uh, where it's dropped off the material that we're, we're producing and by the way um, if you get asked we are not mixing uh, any of the compost when it with uh, with any of the, the wastewater uh, material that used to be the operation uh, when south valley was uh, doing it but that would require a completely different operation. That was part of the problem is they were hauling it out uh, on the west side of Utah Lake and then having to haul it back uh, in for sales and uh, the transportation was causing a problem. So if somebody does ask, we do, we do not mix uh, any of the compost. It's just, uh, it's just uh, degrading um, as it sits. Um, one, other, uh, one other topic that we wanted to cover as far as sanitation today um, we had in our, our rates, our rate increases, you'll see in, in a few minutes when I cover that, uh, that topic, we had recommended a 10% increase. And since the budget has been, had been submitted to uh, finance and to the administration, one of the things that we've been uh, made painfully aware of is um, the, uh, the market on, on recycling. And I actually had uh, Jimmy send to the council staff a couple of articles, one a letter that went out to the participating cities in South uh, Utah Valley Waste District um, uh, announcing a pretty significant increase in our tipping fees in recycling. It was also a, an article from the Wall Street Journal that we included in that same email to the council, just kind of indicating um, how serious a problem that we're facing in recycling, just not just along the Wasatch Front, this is a nationwide um, article that uh, is being uh, and, and an issue that's becoming uh, pretty serious. So the letter that we received from the waste district indicated that they would be increasing the fee to $60 per ton. And again, uh, solid waste, just to put this in perspective a little bit, our solid waste, our black can material, we're still, we're still paying $36. If you remember last year, 
they raised that that same fee went um, I think it was at twenty dollars Wayne uh, some something around twenty dollars up to thirty six and we thought that that was you know kind of a stretch last year when they said well you're going to be basically be paying the same amount for recycling as you do for the black can material well this year they've made it um, you know nearly double not quite but um, it's a that's a pretty steep increase for recycling material and we're seeing that across the board nationwide um, uh, it's becoming a problem please so the price of oil is going up and I know that affected plastics and such so what's driving the situation and, and will rising oil prices help rising um, I think they will rising oil prices certainly will um, um, start to make a difference I don't know how quickly it will make a difference though one of the issues that and and this is this is kind of ironic but we're hearing this from a number of sources in this article it says China last week suspended all imports of US recycled material until June 4th regardless of the quantity the recycling industry interpreted the move as part of the growing rift between the United States and China and 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 it seems to be kind of a shot across the bow kind of a thing um, uh, national politics is hitting home unfortunately but is is this jump that was proposed before the politics no it, I, I think I think they saw this I think the waste districts um, started to see this because most of most of the waste district is going you know locally it goes up to um, South Salt Lake um, uh, Rocky Mountain recycling is is kind of the local uh, um, uh, gatherer of the recycled material and then it goes to California is being shipped off and I think the word was coming back through uh, Rocky Mountain to these waste districts that that they were starting to see some changes in the market they were going to they were going to uh, pass on some increases to the to the waste districts I think this has been coming for a while this is not news just from last week please how much of a subsidy will this involve even with the rate increase in this case has continued recycling so we've had a little bit of conversation internally with the administration about recycling itself. Um, so one of the things, and, and let me answer this, I think it's the, the, the first question first. Um, you, you asked the question about how much of an impact this is gonna make. Uh, based on the same quantity that we did uh, in the past year, it's going to make about a $65,000 change in recycling. So we're actually making a recommendation um, instead of doing uh, recycling, which had been uh, originally proposed in the rate increases we had, we had recommended to go to 650, we are actually recommending another 50 cents on top of that to take the, the recycling can to $7. Um, and so that's the, that's the recommendation. And that's, been, that's a change since we have submitted the budget. So that's just in response to the letter. So- And will that cover then this extra 65,000? Yes, yes, that will. That will generate about sixty-eight thousand dollars, and 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 I have to tell you, and we're a little bit skittish, you know, in in public works about this. The question remains: Is that going to stay consistent at least through the next fiscal year? You know, there's no there's nothing that prohibits the waste district to go mid-year and say, well, we're going to change it because again, market changes or you know whatever, and there's nothing that prohibits them from changing it again. The council could look at the fee increase mid-year. We could, we could, we could adjust it. But we're just telling you, based on what we know today, uh, this is this is a recommendation that we're making. Please. I just find it interesting that it costs almost double, according to what we're being told there, to process um, recyclable material than it does to permanently store waste material that could be made up of all sorts of things in a triple line highly engineered landfill it's I, i've kind of you know expressed the surprise in the yeah. past with with the waste uh the green waste as well where green waste was getting up to about that same cost and it seems it seems particularly we thought this was kind of a temporary um dip or, or you know, spike in the in the market We'll see if you could go out to our giant landfill and then just start dumping the recyclables in a different spot to, to come back later and, and, and process that in the future if, if the market ever recovers. But anyway, just just, just amazed at, at, the, at the market right now. 
even even very uh, environmentally friendly communities like Portland have discontinued their curbside recycling program and are just putting in the landfill. Um, and so it's a, it, it's a nationwide challenge. Um, in part, I think the solid waste district's view sitting on the board um, is it represents about 4% of the total waste that goes into the system and it's got to be handled separately. And that's really the, the issue of the large cost. It's a matter of economies of scale. Um, and, and it's the, as Dave indicated, the drying up of the secondary market. The only thing right now that is profitable for Rocky Mountain Recycling is cardboard. Uh, everything else is a net cost to them. Um, so again, you know, for years and years, we brought recyclables up and we made money uh, at Rocky Mountain Recycling. And now that's turned 180 degrees where it's costing everyone who brings it up today. So it's a secondary market component. It's a, you know, it's a component of um, the, the very small percentage of the waste, which has to be dealt with separately. And so it's, uh, it's just a, you know, so, so the question came up in our discussions, you know, what's the right thing to do? And I think we concluded the right thing to do was to pass the cost of recycling on to those who, who opt, you know, or don't opt out of recycling. Um, you know, we could bury it in the black can fee, and it would be a very small uh, increase to the black can charge. And again, for a long time, we made a substantial subsidy. We still do between uh, those who pay for recycling and those who don't. Uh, you know, there's there's a substantial subsidy still. But again, the thought was, it's it's and it's kind of the same thing the district said was it's kind of it's kind of unfair to bury the cost of recycling and the cost of everything else we do. Uh, if the cities choose to do that, that's fine, but the district should should be totally transparent and share exactly what the full cost of the recycling program is. So, so those are kind of the key components that went into the decision about the $60 tipping fee. So have, <laughs> have people looked at the other options where some communities uh, burn their garbage and or recyclables, maybe they take out the metal. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the waste district has had um, that conversation. I, I've had a little bit of experience having worked in Davis County. They they operate a um, uh, a facility that burns uh, much of their of their garbage. It's a fairly con. I have to tell you, it's fairly controversial. And they're phasing out. Yeah, they, there's there's a lot of residents that aren't happy about it. And I apologize for I, I chose to make a take a phone call, but. Um, Back on the sanitation, it looks to me like our fund balance is deep. We're using our fund balance to make this thing work. It is. Fund balance is getting significantly low in, san in sanitation. And, and is that is that based on this? Green? No. So we've, we've had a couple of things as far as, um, so the fund balance that you're likely looking at is the end of fiscal year 19. Yeah. And and we we one of the supplementals that you'll see in just a minute is we're adding a foreman position um, and and we've had some CIP work that's come out of sanitation, so we've kind of known for a while that sanitation this is one of the this is one of the utilities that we delayed as far as rate increases significantly. So the the first three years of rate increases we had nothing happening in sanitation. We felt like we had to we had to correct the other utilities, so sanitation was left alone. Uh, for a time and so we knew that we were on the decline in sanitation and so we've got three years now uh, last year was the first this would be the second we've got one more year of rate increases to try to bring it back into alignment i'm assuming some of these things that we don't have numbers for is because we're in the midst of change i'm wondering how much we are subsidizing the, the, the green waste um, I, do, uh, I do have <laughs> i do have information on the green waste can so right now and again, green waste is a little bit different uh, uh, conversation. So um, the last time we ran the numbers, we we were having costs in the range of seven dollars and seventy two cents for a, a green uh, a green can. And we're charging um, there's there's a green can cost right there. That's what we're proposing. So we're supplementing that, that with the black can by about two dollars, a little bit more than two dollars. And I love the service. I, I think. We'd be in trouble in some places without it. So I am very grateful for that service. But I do, I am interested in what we, how we are subsidizing it. 
and it's about the same. We can get the information on on uh, the blue can, but we're still subsidizing the blue can, even with that recommendation uh, to to change that by another fifty cents. We still have some uh, black can that's covering the blue can cost. So the substance is the same for both. It's it's darn close. I can I can have Jimmy give exact numbers to the council. Well, it's close. That's fair. It's 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 darn close. Yeah. So for raising the recycling from six six fifty to seven, uh, what about garbage can with recycling? I'm just wondering how many people actually just take a recycling can extra or whatever versus. A lot of people take the can with the black can, and so fifteen fifty. The only was sixteen dollars. That, that that's the recommended change there still is to is to add on another fifty cents on onto that. Sixteen. Yep. So that would be sixteen. Okay. Yeah, I should have clarified that. I apologize. So there's very few people that have. Go ahead, Jimmy. I was going to say, they, they paid the 1550 on top of the 7. And so, uh, so that's where it's yeah. filled with recycling So this is the cost of the black can itself. Just the black can. Just the black can. Go. So if you've got a blue and a black, it's 7 plus 16, it's $23. Right. It'll be 7, yeah. 7 plus 1550. Seven plus fifteen fifty. The fifteen fifty doesn't go up. Yeah, that's not going to go up. Yeah, oh, I, not, well, I apologize. Right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's already. That's not buried in there. Yeah. Everyone so that has a blue can will pay fifty cents or more. So it's seven dollars plus fifteen fifty. If you have a black and a blue can, and that's probably already got two dollars and twenty-two mm -hmm. cents a month subsidizing the recycling. Anyway. Correct. Correct. Okay. Any other questions on that? So yes, you know, to go back to one of the earlier questions, we have had a conversation about recycling, and as Wayne indicated, you know, we, as we talked with the administration, we we felt like we needed to continue to operate the program, and you know, see if you know how this rides out for it for a time. It's I, I don't know that it's time necessarily to you know to say hey we're not going to recycle and. Is it, you know, are there other options that we need to talk with the uh, with the waste district on? And and we certainly got Wayne and John Borda both sit on different committees, uh, different boards with the waste district, and we had we can have that conversation. But you know, there's clearly some signs of um, you know some some rough areas going on in sanitation right now. Please, maybe I'm just too practical, but. And maybe it's too difficult to tell the public, hey, we're changing the program. We only want things that are going to make money. We want your cardboard. We want your aluminum. We want this, that, and the other. Right now, you know, we used to tell people we didn't want glass because there wasn't a market for it. Now there's not a market for some other things, right? Right. And we may we may have to go down that route. Again, the district would have to lead that charge because... They, you know, for Provo just to say, hey, we're only going to do this, and then we've still got other South Valley cities that are, you know, recycling material that wouldn't be acceptable. That does that. That's not going to solve the problem. Well, so you'll be having those conversations. I'm, I'm sure that's part of the the district's conversations already. And, and, and again, some of that will be led by Rocky Mountain. You get, you got to realize that Rocky Mountain is kind of dictating a little bit of this, you know, to the waste districts. And, and so if Rocky Mountain kind of changes their market and says, well, we're only going to do cardboard or we'll do certain types of plastic, we kind of have to follow their lead because they're really our only uh, source of recycling uh, right now. Please. So Dave, <clears throat> the materials we take to the recycling center of Rocky Mountain, some of it, cardboard is the only thing they're profitable. The other things, does it end up in the landfill anywhere? <coughs> there is some. There, there. Um, one of the one of the main complaints that we get from Rocky Mountain, and, and it actually comes out in these articles as well, is contaminated material. Mm -hmm. So whether it's dirty, you know, we always hear about the the, the cheese on the cardboard uh, pizza box. box. You know, that's that's one of the common okay. things in every article. So what about the things that don't have market? What happens to them? So there is some. There is. Actually, don't they land land? Up? Yep. So we're paying. Kind of create this magic that we're recycling. 
or paying a, a premium to take it up there, and they haul up the landfill, and it's then cheaper just for us to haul up the landfill. Well, we actually, we part of our agreement with Rocky Mountain is if they have contaminated material, and, and I think it's just, Bryce can probably correct me if I'm wrong here, but if, if, if it's contaminated material, we actually agree to haul it back and landfill it. So that's part of our agreement with Rocky Mountain. So our trucks from South Valley, and we're stepping out of Provo's operation here a bit, but South Valley will take it from uh, uh, from uh, Springville and they'll the transfer station, they'll take it up to Rocky Mountain. And then if Rocky Mountain has contaminated material, they'll actually haul it back. So they take a full truck up and a full truck back to the landfill. And it's part of it's it's part of our agreement. Bryce? Right now they're not uh, diverting the high cost to get rid of material to a landfill. Right now they are still selling it or paying somebody to take it from them to make plastic out of it or to take the plastic and make something out of it. But it is a cost to them right now. At this point in time, they're not landfilling it. They are certifying it that it's recycled. But once it goes up there, we kind of leave it to their hands whether or not they decide at some future time to to do something else with it. But right now, at this point in time, unless it's contaminated, unless it's an unusable material, it is getting, it is certified getting recycled. So what I'm hearing is the, the people that take the recycled stuff, that re, re, melt down the plastic, whatever, are in a position where they can say, yeah, we used to pay for this, but now you have to pay us to take it. And we do, and they're happy because they're still making money and, and we're paying whatever we have to to get rid of it. And the market uh, domestically in the United States, you know, as far as companies that, that recycle material, it's it's such a small uh, market that we've saturated that market. And that's why we, we used to export, you know, and, and most of this did go overseas. And so when you have a country that comes in and says, well, we're not going to take exports from the United States anymore, it's it's significant. Thanks, Dave. We're about a half an hour out now, so it's okay. Ready. If you have more questions, he's more than willing to yep. take phone calls for this. Can you talk about something? I have a question about Bulldog Boulevard. You're receiving a huge number of that emails. I've talked with him about that. <laughs> we we've already had a conversation about that, and we'll uh, we'll talk internally about what our options are there. But but I I, I didn't know. I looked at the CAP, and two hundred fifty thousand certainly wasn't enough for construction. I didn't know we were planning on doing it this year. Okay, so maybe it's two different questions oh. here. So oh, you're talking about the, the complete street Bulldog Boulevard yeah. versus the day Bulldog Boulevard. Yeah. So, so Bulldog itself, we're, most of the revenue for Bulldog is coming through either state or MAG. Um, it's, a com it's a combination of funds. So the only thing that you're seeing in the city's budget is matching funds. Um, so um, it's a, it, where's Dave? It's like a four and a half million dollar project or is it higher than that? So it's, it's, it's a significant project and, and again, Two twenty-five is in our CIP budget. It's just that's just the match that's coming from city funds. So is it a goal? As far as I know, it is. I know that they're having public meetings on that, George, and I think that's something that we as a council need to get involved. I mean, I in don't think we're a goal, so I, I would we like need to talk to about that at <coughs> some point. Have a further dialogue. So your question is, if we didn't give our match, would it still be a goal? That's not a I guess. It was a four and a half million dollar project. How much is our match? Is it an equal match? So I mean, just how much is the match, Dave? Two hundred fifty this month or this year, and then six point seven for the whole project, just not for this initial study. I believe we have money from last year as well, and so this is this second portion of that match. Again, it's a, it's a pretty small amount that the city's contributing to a rather large project, so please. So, uh, this, I don't think it's on the agenda, so we probably should, should keep this really short. I, I, I apologize. I've been on the, I was on the uh, TMAC committee before I joined the council, so I know there's been conversations. I just don't know if they were in the council or, or 
council back then. Um, I think a lot of those emails are being generated not by people who attended the open house, but one person attended the open house and sent out kind of a, a, a concern letter, and then we're getting a lot that's just kind of saying exactly what the person that was raising the alarm. But um, there, there's a there's a whole lot there. Like that section of the, that road was the highest or second highest in the state. It's the highest as far as accidents. Accident. The highest. Um, I, highest in the state for accidents. Actually, seven right. times the the state average. I just thought there would be a time. It hasn't gone since I was on the council. Okay. We, to be a time it was before we time. did have a meeting before you were on the council yeah. this time, George. Right. I remember it, but I think it's time that we have that yeah. discussion yeah. again. It would be helpful. We will do that. Yeah. Cliff, right. let's make sure we get that on the. We're happy to do that. Jimmy or Kelsey, Bryce, we need to switch. Um, <laughs> Doing that, Bryce. So the next question that I was asked to to address was utility rate increases, and and um, and one of the questions that came up was what what benefit have um, has the city um, received from uh, past rate increases, and then we'll talk about future rate increases. So as far as the past rate increases, particularly in the water area, um, we've we uh, we've. Uh, constructed uh, two new large reservoirs that, um, that service the west side and the outfall line. So these are the two tanks. They sit at the same elevation, one in Slate Canyon, one out on Columbia Lane. I think the council has um, probably toured or at least had an opportunity to, to tour both facilities. An air photo of, of both of these sections. So this is the one that's up in Slate Canyon, comes down, goes down 900 south, eventually crosses underneath the railroad tracks and uh, starts to serve. We actually the railroad tracks is, um, um, if you can picture where the railroad tracks cut through Provo, that's actually the top, what we call the top of the water zone. So that's the eastern boundary of the water zone. So from the railroad tracks west uh, to our furthest boundary, that's the new water zone. And, and these two tanks service that area. So this is the primary benefit from past rate increases. You may recall we bonded, I think it was in fiscal year 15. Um, we bonded for $12 million and, and, uh, to, to pay for the project, uh, the two tanks. And uh, this is the second tank, and they, again, work together, um, same elevation. So this is the one that's up off of Columbia Lane. The outfall line cuts through Grandview uh, down 1500 west and, and comes down to um, 820 north and cuts underneath the freeway and, and again, services uh, west of uh, the railroad tracks. So the primary benefit clearly in rate increases are the two tanks. We also have several other projects. We, uh, we've done wells, we continue to do wells. We actually have three wells that are, um, uh, one well that's being rehabbed and then two new wells that are being designed right now. And uh, the rate increases as far as the future projects will primary, primarily focus on uh, development of wells because we have water rights that need to be uh, perfected, uh, need to be utilized. So the city in the past has bought water rights. We're not fully use, utilizing those water rights just because the demand's not there, but we also need the facilities in, in place so that as the demand starts to increase, we can utilize the water rights. So our, our, our primary focus, one of our primary focuses is, um, is the wells. The other main focus that Jimmy uh, pointed out, and let me go back to one slide here. I think it's actually right here. One thing that the council should note, we've set up what I'll call savings accounts for um, two or three different large projects that we anticipate coming in the future. So we have a 48 inch redundant line um, uh, to uh, parallel um, the, the existing 48 that comes down Canyon Road. We started setting money aside for that. Also, the reservoirs that are up by the MTC. We have two very old reservoirs uh, at that location. Another one up in uh, Rock Canyon Park. All of those are, are scheduled in the next uh, 10, maybe 15, 20 years that need to be replaced. So in order to do that and not bond based on, on the direction from the council, we've started to set aside money um, in different accounts to, to pay for those so that we don't have to bond. With the end of fiscal year 19, we'll have about $6.3 million saved up in various accounts in the water fund for those type of projects. And that's that's getting you know very significant so that we do not have to bond in the future. So again, 
primary benefits for the rate increases in water. In wastewater, um, we've done, you can read where we've gone in, uh, done some improvements that were uh, dramatically needed in the headworks and the UV building, uh, some, some, uh, some things at the treatment plant. And then um, it also, the primary funding for, um, for some of the west side improvements are still sitting in that, uh, in that bond money. Um, and, and the rates are, are providing uh, for uh, some of those west side improvements that, that, uh, that need to be done still. That project has started. Um, if you go out on 3110 West, uh, we've got a contractor that's uh, uh, starting to put in some uh, improvements. And, and obviously, it's just the, the very beginning of the improvements uh, out on the west side. In stormwater past projects, um, we've done some improvements on uh, 1500 West, Windsor, uh, Canyon Road, uh, the uh, 800 North Siphon, and then probably the biggest one that was uh, probably the most impactful, uh, the Kiwanis Wasatch uh, Elementary School uh, detention ponds. Um, as far as, um, well, one other uh, point that, that Jimmy, and I think it's a good point to, to uh, reiterate to the council, those rate increases also allow us um, where we have combined projects, just like on Stadium Avenue, where we had three utilities going up, needing to go up uh, Stadium Avenue. They also uh, played a, uh, a heavy role in rebuilding the road after the utilities went in. So a little bit more than half of the surface improvements in Stadium Avenue were paid through the utility funds. So I, I think that's important to, to note. Um, a little bit about um, uh, 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 the, the history uh, transfer to the CIP. So you can read the columns. Jimmy went back, and we showed the council this information before. We went back in uh, uh, the previous 10 years prior to the, the, the rate increases. You can see how much we are transferring in water, wastewater, and stormwater into CIP projects. And, and you can see in some of those cases, um, you know, um, even in 12 to 14, we were only transferring $67,000, um, you know, to, to, to do stormwater. And, and you, can't even, you can't even do a reasonable size pipe project with $67,000. It's just not going to um, uh, make it happen in, in stormwater. So, um, uh, again, the primary reason for, for rate increases are master plans and CIP projects that are being identified in those master plans. And they're just saying, you, you know, the information that we're getting is, you, you know, you need to, get, to move along on some of these CIP projects. There's a real need in many of the areas. And so um, the, the real driver here is CIP projects. And you can see each fiscal year, we're getting up in the four and a half, um, you know, $5 million range in transfers of CIP projects. And, and, it's, and it's, it's making a significant difference. Just real quick, and this is CIP transfer. This is not general fund transfer. That's completely separate. This is just this is this is what's left over after we do operations in stormwater and water and wastewater. So all you know, the transfer of the general fund, everything has happened, and we've taken everything out of op, from for operations. How much money is left to go out and do CIP projects? That's what's shown here. Thank you. So this is a table we've shown a number of times to the council, um, and, and again, we're in fiscal year where uh, the recommendations that we're, we're showing to the council are shown in fiscal year 19. These are the percentage increases. These are the dollar amounts that are being uh, made on an average monthly bill uh, for the residents. And again, we're, we're sensitive. I'm, I, I know that this is uh, an impact. It's a significant impact to, to residents, and it has been for a number of years. That's, that's Probably one of my main concerns here is um, it, it's drug on, and and we've, um, you know, we we've enjoyed the support of the administration, the the council, um, but we're we're also trying to be sensitive to the fact that this is, um, you know, we're we're we've we've done this for for quite a bit of time. Um, again, one of the points that I will will make is the water rate increases are at least getting back into what I would call a reasonable range. You know, um, something in the range of inflation is probably, sh you know, should be anticipated each year. Um, the one area that I'm still very worried about is wastewater. And we've indicated already to the council a couple of presentations on the wastewater treatment plant primarily is our rate increases are not over in the wastewater um, area. And uh, we've, we've got some challenges, you know, still in years to come. 
that are probably off the chart, probably off the, 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 the year chart, um, you know, shown in 21, 22, 23, we've, we've got some rate increases that are still needed to be coming. Would you do the plant help with those things? Would that and that add enough to the CIP that we might not have to raise those up so much? Well, the, 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 new, the new wastewater treatment plant actually is, is part of the reason for the increases itself. The, the, the bond, whether we bond for it or whether we try to pay for it um, you know, with cash, um, either way, we're showing that rate increases are needed for the treatment plant. Now, there's, there's some potential revenue, you know, and, and, and I think in the, in the conversations about the treatment plant, we've been careful to kind of uh, show the worst case scenario. And if the treatment plant had to be funded completely from utility rate increases, that's what the council has seen. Now, that hasn't factored in increases in impact fees or, you know, other revenue through water reuse or, you know, other emerging technologies. So um, this this would have, we could cover a revenue bond with these rates. Is what you're saying? Well, well, what I'm saying is, in we got to for wastewater. This call, this row right here, should have probably at least three more years shown on it, and 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 you're going to still see some increases in 21, 22, and 23. Okay. Same percentage. Jimmy, do you remember the percents? We could. We could pull it out. It's 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 been in one of the presentations. We we could show the council. And those would actually even then increase even more with a revenue bond. Yeah, if 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 you remember, let me give you the general information. So right now, our average monthly bill in wastewater alone is a tad over forty. I think it's forty two, forty three dollars, something like that. And the remember the chart that looked like spaghetti that you know that 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 we created in one of the presentations. We, sh we showed a number of varieties for funding, but nearly all of them got in the 80 to 90. In fact, one of them was up in the $100 per month range. So, you know, we're talking about doubling, you know, the, the current $40 bill. We're going to get into the range of about $80 by fiscal year 23, 24. But we're going to go up these percentages anyway. That's right. Okay. okay. This is just on that path. That matches electricity. Unfortunately, it is. No. And it's and it, and again, it's one of those it's one of those issues that I'm very concerned about. Um, but I'm I'm not sure that we have another path. We're getting told, you know, again, the regulations are are coming down so tight on us, um, you know, and and it's one of those decisions about do we act now or do we. You know, decide to wait for 10 years until you see that second set of regulations come into effect. And if they do come into effect the way we're getting told, are we going to be in a worse position in 10 years and, and be forced to do a treatment plant and have no other options at that point? At least we've got a few options at this point still open. And again, it's, it's one of those areas where, you know, cities, uh, state representatives may be able to to play um, a role where you know we step in to our our local DWQ people, you know DEQ people, and and try to 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 make some some difference there. But um, I'm kind of looking even at the local industry. You know, you're looking up and down the Wasatch Front. You're seeing uh, South Valley uh, Waste District responding to, or excuse me, not South Valley. Um, uh, What's the one in South South Salt Lake County? Um, Central Valley. Yeah, Central Valley is in the middle of Salt Lake County. They've already responded. Salt Lake City's already responded. Both of them have made uh, huge financial, uh, you know, decisions to to spend a lot of money to to uh, anticipate the new regulations. Uh, South uh, Davis has has made the same uh, same commitment. You know, again, up and down the Wasatch Front, you can see. Uh, the districts uh, responding and and the municipalities responding to the to the uh, regulations that the states put on us. So as far as um, um, well, let me let me talk of a couple of other cities um, as far as increases that that are coming in their tentative budgets. Now, obviously, their their councils have not approved this, but as far as um, the staff recommendations, so this is coming from Orem City. 
you can see the percent increases. You can see the water and the and the and the storm water, wastewater areas that they're they're making some adjustments in. So they're they're starting to respond as well. Um, again, this is a page right out of the Orem tentative budget, uh, re reflective in the in the previous chart that Jimmy prepared. You can see our stormwater fee, and I'll show you one other city. Um, our stormwater fee is at nine dollars and ninety cents proposed with the coming budget. So there's there's a, a few cities that are starting to respond in, as far as stormwater as well. If I appreciate this is awesome. We, can we get these? Maybe we gotta get these. We have about fifteen minutes left, so maybe if we could get this sent to the council. We can. Salt Lake, same type of a thing. The information really the most important piece of the. Of the, of the puzzle. This comes right from the Salt Lake uh, tentative budget. You can see what they're doing as far as rate increases. And in sewer, Salt Lake, we in the last presentation, we mentioned um, um, uh, Salt Lake had made a commitment that they would, they would also, a commitment, I guess, I don't know if that's the right word, but they had indicated to the residents that they would be doubling their sewer fee in the next five years or so. Um, Spanish Fork, same type of a thing. Again, stormwater rate see where they're going so um, these are just very quickly based on what our recommendations are to the administration to the council this is uh, the rate increases and the impacts in each of these areas and I'm going to skip through this fairly quickly Again, we're making that recommendation to go to seven so these are the different size of meters. I'm not sure if the council is interested in knowing specific uh, meter increases. We're also making a couple of other recommendations as far as um, uh, fees uh, in wastewater. I had mentioned this um, in, in the public works presentation a couple of weeks ago. So people that are residents that are within 300 feet of the, of the uh, sewer system are charged a monthly fee, even though they're not connected to the sewer system, we, we still charge them a monthly fee. But we have been doing the uh, previous base fee of five dollars and fifteen cents, and we're recommending that 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 match. This is the base fee for a resident that is connected to the sewer, and we're rec we're recommending that that um, be increased to the base fee. Also, recommending parking adjustments and um, hangar lease uh, adjustments at the airport. And then the last question that I was asked to cover uh, by council staff was supplementals. This is actually the last slide. Um, so we had seven supplementals that we submitted to the administration for their consideration. Two of the supplementals are actually, as we worked with uh, finance and internally with Jimmy and, and some of the division directors, we figured out how to fund them out of the current fiscal years. And so that's actually the reason that they are not showing in the, in the upcoming uh, budget proposal. So um, the, the lift crane right here, the, the one that's in the uh, fleet building, and then this one right here, the asphalt uh, around the salt building, um, we funded out of the current fiscal year. The other ones, we figured out uh, methods of funding them in the, in the upcoming budget, um, and, and they're recommended. You can see how the, we've split them out, either through general fund or some of the utilities. So I think that's actually the, yeah, that's the last slide. So unless there's any questions, on any of those topics, I think that's all I had. Just a quick question. How do we justify a base fee for a sewer fee when they are on a sewer? How does that, that justify? So the, the city code actually um, requires, and I think there's, uh, I don't know if Gary can correct me here on this, but um, the, there are some state requirements for someone. I know in the city code there's a requirement for a resident to hook up to the wastewater system if if you're within 300 feet we don't we haven't forced that on some residents but if they choose not to do it then we say fine we're going to still charge you that base fee so that's kind of the that's kind of the justification because we have a city code that says you're supposed to be hooked up if you're within 300 feet and some some still don't it's, it's a public health issue it is to have these uh, takes. So, so we don't want to create a financial incentive for people not to. Okay, that's. Thank you. Any other questions? You did awesome. Thank you very much. Not quite as happy. We, we gained. <laughs> <laughs>
we, we council have any, any direction changes they want to make with respect to what they're proposing? One thing with these, no. I think George does bring up a point that I think it would be good for the council to understand uh, Bulldog Boulevard and that things are going forward on that well, at some point. We'll coordinate with the council staff and get it on the next work session. We'll have Dave come. Is is that soon enough? Do we need to do it faster than that? It's not It's not going to happen for a year or so, from what I understand. So It's actually, construction starts... It's the anticipation. Is it on the So I think that we need to have that discussion sooner than later. And it's in and it's in the upcoming budget. So if the city matches in the budget. Yeah. So it came up with one of the constituents. Like, why don't we do a uh, kind of a test run where you, you block it off and you mark it out and see how it works and, and see what kind of the feedback you get before we actually do it it won't matter because what if you block that off it's going to be a learning curve it, it's going to take you a long time but i get what you're saying i mean it's you're going to get you're going to get a lot of outcry if you block it off <laughs> well no more so than when you do it for real i mean you're right, you're right. i think you get a lot more if you don't if, than if you do it for real because I mean, well, you know you know that it's a, you know that it's optional as opposed to not optional <laughs> so we're, I think it's a, I think it's a discussion that we need to at least be aware of as a council. When we had that discussion before, it was informational because we knew that we were, they were going to go out and talk to the businesses and get feedback, and then we were going to have meetings, and they're still having that those opportunities. They're going out still. Um, we we've had the public meetings. What happened was is they've been wrapping up the design. Uh, they've been completing the environmental section of the design and they came back and said just to make sure that we've met all of the environmental requirements we need to add a couple of public hearings and so that's the only reason why these recent public hearings have been held and that's what started to generate some of these uh, you know, emails and things no. I think so we like if you if you can come back we'd sure appreciate it. I would appreciate we, it. We can coordinate with the administration. We'll get a schedule with the council staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well the um well Scott's coming up. We uh, we allotted 30 minutes for this next discussion. And we asked them to talk about their fee changes, and we asked them to talk about the triple play program and their supplemental request. I think one comment before the starts. Yeah. We just handed out to you an updated supplemental request list. And there are the two columns that kind of came about as a result of the council's discussion that we had. Okay. There's now a funded 2018 column, and there's also an unfunded column. So that'll help you as you kind of go through. Just want to make sure that you're aware of that. Thank you to the council administration for this opportunity to talk about the parks and recreation budget for this year. I am aware of the timeline, five minutes for each one of the uh, topics that were listed on the information sheet, and then also five minutes for questions. I will leave you, it seems like questions seem to go along with the presentation most of the time, so we'll go with that route. Let's talk about the fee changes. The ones that were noted in the request were pavilion rental charges, cemetery fees, and sports fees and programs fees. Some discussion on those. So uh, Jenny Starley, our Parks Division Office Assistant and Staff, created a, a detailed report, and I've got a hard copy of that. I'll give it to Cliff if he doesn't critique the graphs. And then I like, you know, Never leave that down. <laughs> And this shows um, our pavilion comparisons with our neighbors here. So
So um, Provo to the left, Orem in the middle, Springville. If you look at the averages on the bottom, uh, Provo has an average price of about $48 at 41 cents. If you're doing the capacity and price comparison, um, Orem is at an average price of 88.32 with a 74 per person, and then Springville 81. And we probably haven't done this detailed study. Jenny did a great job for us. This brings in about $100,000 every year right now. So, you know, the cost model on this really depends on what you want to put as the cost of the pavilion, whether it's cleaning or whether it's turf or cleaning the restrooms, those type of elements. But as you know, $100,000 is a lot less than our overall parks maintenance budget. So this is, um, it's asking the question, was this having to do with cost or marketing? I think it has to do with both. Um, the market side is this is what we're seeing here. And in a program which is most likely could be a subsidized program with the services it require, at this pricing level, we are importing other people's park pavilion parties coming to Provo. This is an overall graph of the, all of our parks and the pavilions that are in those. Tough to see. I have to put on reading glasses when I look at it myself. But um, I will provide this report to council staff for distribution so you're able to take a look at it also. But it really reflects higher capacity. A bigger pavilion will have a higher cost. And that kind of goes with the idea, more people, more cleanup. Um, more sanitation work and more effort to get it set up for that area. Um, the two graphs here show um, current price and suggested price. So you can see some stayed the same. An example, Lions Park, which is one of our largest pavilions, pretty substantial increase recommended there. So do we have any particular facilities that are really, really popular to the point where it's hard to book and maybe we need to price it accordingly to lower the demand? We, we did not try to do demand adjustment as part of this. So, you know, it's still first come, first served, and they, you know, and we, we love the fact that, in fact, Parks and Recreation is all about creating popular places that people want to come to. So we really didn't get into demand pricing. What we just got into was you know, the capacity and size of the bill and the, how big a party or how big of a get together you can have there compared to the pricing, very similar to our neighborhood community. So we didn't do that as a fact. The so next, I, 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 oh, sorry. I noticed the one at Lions Park was the highest price in the Pavilion City. Is that correct? That 133? I think there's some 122s. It is our, you know, on their number here, that is the 410, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Doug, the Lions Park one? So that is our, our largest pavilion in the system. And right now, for that pavilion, we charge $55. And you can see what some of the bigger pavilion costs are in other communities here. So just based on that size and capacity, that ends up being there. That is, that is the big one. Do, do we charge more for non-residents than residents? Well, what we first come first serve. What we found, I, I don't think we do resident non-resident because they will always find a resident to book them for it. You know, so that there that has a loophole system to it. So we just to make it quicker and be able to do it online and add to the convenience of that. We didn't do the resident non-resident. Let's talk about cemetery fees. We haven't raised those fees in eight years. Um, at that area, we'd like to do small adjustments instead of infrequent bigger changes. We held off during construction. I think that's it's never a good idea to raise fees during construction time. Um, it brings us to the regional average, so that is a market and cost because also our wages have gone up for providing some of these services. And then we about 15% of our fees are recommended for that adjustment. Um, an example was an internment, I think, went up a uh, hundred dollars, fourteen hundred to fifteen hundred dollars. So it's based on market in the area to make sure we're not out of market and also based on our rising costs of labor and operation. Sports fees, I, I've gone over this with the council before, but 
this is how we set our fees in our programs. We look at direct costs. We look for 150% um, target return. Then we divide that by the number of expected participants. We don't play the game where maximum participants is what we've got, have gotten in the program in past years. That calculated fee that comes from that is compared to the market. If we are over market, then we will allow working down to 125% rate of return. If that is still out of market and it comes up a lot in senior and adaptive type programming, you know, where the fees are slower, then they have a discussion with me and we, we talk about our fee setting or whether or not we will do that program. Some of the sports program fees changes were an example of girls softball going up when you compare girls softball to boys baseball, same number of games, very similar equipment. But for some reason, there was an anomaly where girls softball was much less than boys baseball. So this kind of brought them utilizing this model. Also in adult basketball, winter league versus summer league, same amount of games, same officials, same facilities. Yet for some reason, we priced the summer league less than the adults. So we brought that up to similar treating a similar product in a similar way and that would that helped when you we hired a new set of eyes a new sports supervisor and he pointed out some of these things that maybe didn't make a whole lot of sense to an outside party so that new set of eyes always helped yeah just the, the total cost times one hundred and fifty percent help me understand what that means is okay. that mean that we're not subsidizing but we're actually generating revenue off of these programs on the direct cost yes so if the, a program costs $100 to run, we will set fees and try to bring in 150 and that helps to work towards some of our overhead and some of our full-time costs. That aren't so even that for youth sports and all of that is following this model? It all follows the same model. All right, thank you. Okay. Any more questions on fees before I move to triple play? How am I doing on time? <laughs> Where did triple play come from? It kind of came out of the, the genesis of the Peaks Ice Arena, which had a subsidy of a total of each side contributing 168,000 towards the ice arena just in this past budget year. And then all of a sudden being faced that we may be taking this on ourselves. So we really looked at what were some of the ways we could look at to try to take on this operation in a side that would not burden the city and create a you know a budget ask or a budget crisis within itself but then we changed our paradigm and said how can we make our product better how can we get more and more citizens interested in our product and be able to expand our services and it really created a, a different way to look at it and that's where the triple play came from so here's is the triple play and the specifics on it the rec center on the far left is still obviously a rec center membership gives you full rec center use and there'll even be some experience amenities or expanded hours depending on capacity that our rec center members could get out of the triple play also the golf course which is in the middle 50 percent caught off the cost of the par three course 50 percent off a bucket of balls at the driving range foot golf 50 percent off um, you have free access to the facility and the practice greens and then free group lessons, which will be run just like a fitness class at the recreation center. You can see all this goes towards building the sport amongst our citizens, introducing the sport more to our citizens and expanding the capacity and our involvement in our citizens here. Now that the mayor's office and the mayor has got us through this with this with the county, we have the Peaks Ice Arena that is available to be part of this triple play. A double play is not as unique as a triple play in baseball. So free open skating for everybody with a rec center membership. Uh, functional fitness facility will be uh, offered so we can expand some of our fitness program to the Peaks Ice Arena with rec center members. It's We've got an existing facility with space we can utilize, much, much less expensive than a new construction project or building an additional rec center weekly classes in fitness and then we open ourselves up to some new and exciting um, fitness elements that our citizens have been asking for so there was a question on the the cost well we're utilizing our additional assets and our additional operations 
and any extra costs come in just come from um, maybe extra supplies and materials and they're all in the budgets and ready to go. So when we look at this, the rec center pays for the use of its members at these other facilities and also for the package involvement we are with our target we're looking some memberships and if it's the golf course that brings in more rec center memberships if it's the peaks ice arena or if it's just this overall attractive package then if that creates the excitement we're looking at a distribution model of about 30 percent to east bay 30 percent to the peaks and 40 percent to the rec center with, even with this distribution, just so we're perfectly clear, the rec center contribution to the general fund of $500,000 is still there, still exists. This is an additional amount, 500,000 over and above what we're bringing in right now. So 500,000 sounds like a lot of money and it used to, you know, in the parks and recreation program, that used to be more than our total budget for our, some of our, um, especially our recreation center facility at Provo High but that is only about 10% of our revenues that we bring in at the current recreation center. So we are experiencing increases right now that are somewhere around five to 7% and depending on the market, getting close to 10. So we feel very confident with this exciting element of triple play that we're gonna get a lot more interest in our memberships here. Just give you an idea of how citizens are looking at this. We announced a triple play on Thursday, and in three days, the website visits on the city site were second only to the rec center, which had been operating all month long. And the average person is staying five minutes and getting to know the information on our webpage. So this is getting out there, and this is something that they're excited about all the way through. The budgets don't change in, you, in the different areas. You're still able to track the success of the Peaks Ice Arena separate from the uh, golf course, separate from the ice sheet. And those revenues will come into there either through rental or admissions, and they'll be distributed from the revenue line item at the rec center. Is that correct, Dustin? That's the process that's set up there. So we do not have any unfunded operating costs as part of this program. So still, it's a unique program. It's, it's gonna make us very unique in the world. I, I challenge anybody to go here to find another city that is going to be in this same situation with their recreation facilities completely funded. But as a safety valve, the first dollars that come in from the membership can go towards covering those facilities that had a subsidy last year. So we cover those needs before we distribute to the rec center for its needs. So that means we won't be coming back to the council to say, I guess we are gonna need a little bit of that subsidy back. And then this concept that we're not used to balancing revenues and expenses, we do that every single year. If numbers aren't coming in how we thought, then we, we balance back with expenses all the time. And we'll be tracking this as closely as anybody looking at how our membership revenues are matching before we make any expenditures and commit ourselves to anything. We just don't spend appropriation. Yes. Have you considered going to Washington to destroy the federal government? <laughs> no, we don't want to lose it. <laughs> I can barely handle where I'm at, George. Taking okay, our own public works, water, sewer, garden. <laughs> triple play there. Yeah. Not as sexy, but it is a triple play. Um, we have some capacity increases that we'd like to do looking at areas like expanding the field house fitness over at the Peaks Ice Arena, expanding the driving range so we can get more people onto that and longer time. We're talking about utilizing funds existing in the foundation that were collected um, by Ray Beckham and his great work and to be able to expand rec center members and their privileges that can go to some of these other facilities. We're also talking about you know, utilizing some capital funds that are available through additional revenue share and also looking at additional or existing capital that are in these budgets. So we don't need that investment. We feel like we can cover that ourselves. Um, there was a concern listed in, is does this match with the city county agreement? And this was openly discussed as, as you guys know. 
talking about this ability and this fee structure. So we feel very confident and I feel like the county knows why we're doing this because we were taking on, we took on a major operation. I don't know if they expected us to be this innovative, but we have actually you know, gone to where the city is actually better off for taking on the Peaks Ice Arena financially. Scott? Yeah. On that agreement with the county, so that, that triple play will be available to county wide then? You can right now come in and buy a rec center membership. Pay a higher fee. You're going to pay, pay a higher fee for the, fee the rec for center. The play. They were our legal department was very careful and and very dialed in on saying that the fees are the fees associated just with that facility. So we were able to have that discussion and work our way through that. And part of that was that they weren't allowed to. The increment that's added for the the ice center can't be different for anybody else. If there's an incremental difference between resident and non-resident, it's for the other two aspects of our facilities. So, really, in a summary, it seems like this is a, was an when we came to this an easy answer for us whether or not we go forward it. So this budget year, the impact is we eliminate all general fund subsidies to recreation facilities in this year's budget saving an additional $300,000 annually. The rec center still pays an additional 500,000 from rec center revenue and all of this while delivering a better product for our citizens. So I think that checks the box in the parks and recreation line. Thank you, George. <laughs> quick, quick question on that. Do we, do we, it's, just, it's just a anticipate increases in the rec center annual pass? We don't. No fee increase, and that's, that's a great question. No fee increase was included with this because of the success story that we're gaining out of so many members of the rec center. So no fee increase to any of our citizens. Question. What's going on with the Seven Peaks uh, water park and that, will that affect us? Everything affects us when it is recreation in the community. They've made an announcement that I think the last time we heard it, it'll be an opening in July uh, is why they put up a clock with a countdown and they took down the countdown clock and said, <laughs> maybe a little bit longer. You know? <laughs> so, um, but Bryce Merrill, who is in the back of the room, our rec center manager is, is really gearing up with contingency plans and ideas. If we're the only pool operating in the month of June, you know, until Seven Peaks Water Park um, becomes available, we need that facility in our community to be able to cover our, both our citizens and our visitors. But I thought that was good news when another owner came in and talked about operating that facility. We're excited. Springville facility is also newly open and can provide a little bit of a relief valve. It can. I think their outdoor pool is, is set for end of June, if I'm not mistaken. So they've got a little bit of time that we're still on our own here. So but Scott, we've talked about a triple play. If we had a fourth facility, would we call it a home run? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, whatever ideas you come up with for that fourth new facility, you know, I think you can count on Parks and Recreation to come up with an idea for a fourth facility at some point. So we're excited about that. So this doesn't have too much to do with this year's budget, but I just can't help myself sometimes. And this is a running tab on the success that you've seen. And this doesn't even take into account of the efficiencies in our parks elements and the things we've done. I feel like this is part of my job to brag and talk about our department. The rec center, Eldridge Center, the center, we're approaching a million dollar subsidy when we sold that bond. Now we have eliminated that subsidy and now contrib contribute 500,000 annually. That's a $1.5 million difference. Peaks Ice Arena, when we first started together, $800,000 subsidy. Now it's at zero. Cubby Center started at 636, now down to 343. The only art center in the world that I know of that actually reduces its subsidy, which is pretty amazing, you know, for, for that audience and that user group. East Bay Golf Course at 500,000, now zero. So what we're really talking about is over $3 million in total general fund contribution reductions over the last decade. And those are obviously compounded annually. So I know it doesn't feel like this makes your guys' budget world any easier, but hopefully you feel like you've got a partner in Parks and Recreation. The only one we have a bond on is the rec center, right? So it is. All those are fully paid. All those are completely debt-free, and citizens 
voted with their general obligation to pay for that bond. So you, you said you don't don't think that it makes uh, it feel like our budget is any easier, or whatever. But I absolutely, this does. This this is this is wonderful, and it, it absolutely makes the rest of our, our budget easier. Um, That's why we put public works presentation first. And this <laughs> so we can walk out of here with a smile. Once. Uh, public works has the unfortunate problem that they, they do something wrong. Everyone knows about That's it, and right. it puts it, and it puts a bad name on the city. They do everything right; they're invisible. Right. You know, yes. you do everything right, and you not only help us financially, but you give the city an identity and a personality and a, and a culture that everyone really appreciates. So. And, and still have that level of importance. I've always said during orientations that you'll drive to work and you'll hit that pothole and you'll say, gee, I wish they would fix that thing. If I open the rec center 15 minutes late, we're all getting 100 cops. <laughs> so their level of expectation for excellence on us is pretty high. You know, the city of Utah has these four facilities. Anyone? Well, you know, there's Salt Lake County, you know, has a smattering of these type of facilities. County, but no city. Yeah, but no city. So we, so it's, that makes it hard to compare, but there are other cities outside. But normally this type of independence and this type of support from our citizens, because let's face it, that's where this all comes from, is because our citizens utilize our facilities at a high level. That's how we're able to do this. I would be curious nationally how many have that many. But the nice sheet and a Kobe Center and a golf course and a rec center. I mean, I'd be surprised if you. And have them all for that annual price tag. Well, even 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 have them. Yeah, period. yeah, yes. We have great amenities at a great price. I think that's you're exactly right. The annual bond payment is around three million a year. Is that correct? Three point six. Yeah. So three points, you know, we're, so we're, we're, we're paying on the, the rec center three points, three point six, three point two, three point two. We're getting five hundred thousand back from that. I mean, not not that we were expecting it, but 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 the way I'm looking at it is, since the residents voted to take that obligation on, there's been a reduction in, in three million dollars. Um, in operation. In operation. And so, I mean, it's almost as if, because of the success of the rec center, it's almost as if we're getting that rec center for free, in a way. Because we were investing that three, three million dollars a year, and now we're still investing three hundred million dollars for three million dollars a year, but we're getting so much more. So it's just it's remarkable. I have heard, and help me with this, and maybe we'll need Paul to come in and talk about the Covey Center, that he says there are certain investments that we could possibly make that actually could help us reduce some of that subsidy even further. Um, have you got any information about that, or is this something we need to talk with Paul about? And I think the wrap tax and the dedication of the wrap tax towards the Covey, I think right now the allotment's about 50000 a year, is going to, we're upgrading our amenities, upgrading our use. You know, so there are some things that, that we can do. Um, there were some staffing efficiencies, also the popularity of the programs, things like the black box. I was just in meeting with Paul yesterday. It's completely self-supported, you know, as a theatrical venue, which is absolutely amazing. And, you know, we're getting more and more into teaching dance classes and as those become popular. So we're finding areas in diversification of program, and that has really worked at the Peaks Ice Arena when we added the turf. So we didn't just have ice skaters there. We also have winter soccer players and all that. It, diversification of programming is the success story for our recreation programs. We get more people with different interests coming to our facilities. And I think Paul can pull from that same model. And, and I, I know when we had Foreigner come, we had Air Supply come, those were also public partners that we were able to use with, and he says those really help our center become more uh, visible. Fiscal. Yeah. yeah, all of a sudden the people are noticing even more what's happening at the Covey Center with those exciting events. Are we doing enough public partnerships? Is that something that we need to look into? Is it um, I think we were kind of going through a transitional phase with the the Arts Council and also staffing and booking and all that. And I, you know, with the mayor's office support, I think we're really getting that dialed in. And I think we're, we'll get back to those elements that really, you know, 
Covey Center is a very special place, and I think those type of things will be featured there again in the future. So supplemental request was the last one. Um, I wasn't being sarcastic when I say we appreciate approval of self-funded requests because just like what we talked about in our pre-budget meeting, um, and I think Wayne and John and Dustin hopefully saw that, we came with a lot of our own solutions about ways to um, discontinue those things that are less effective and, can, and do those things that are our noting revenue increases. So a lot of these things allow us to solve some of our own problems and really promote our managers to move forward with exciting ideas. One concern that you noted was a number one priority was the part-time salary internal solution and recruitment. I, Dustin and Paul Dearden got together, uh, I think found some revenues based out of some successes in ticket sales and box office. So the transaction fee. So we were, we were able to find an internal solution to that. So we'll be able to make those hirings without asking for any more budget. Um, one that just wanted to talk about a little bit is special events. And Mary Dunn is here, who was our special events coordinator in the back. She kind of has a twofold issue going on. Is right now the events she runs for us, things like Pioneer Day, Movies in the Park, Countdown, Senior Events, Rec Center Events, Halloween Carnival, Science Palooza, Christmas Tree Lighting, Christmas Market, all those elements we are seeing multiple thousands of people coming to these, not multiple hundreds anymore. She's a superstar. She's done absolutely great. So Isaac just walked in and he, his daughter just had a reception. And Isaac, a reception would be a lot more expensive if 3,000 people came to it rather than 300, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what Mary is facing. She is facing these increased supplies and staffing needs and we have not been able to get this through the budget i think I, for a couple years now and so then the other side of the, the dual twofold issue is that mary is also asked to help with things like the rooftop concert series and provider staff for that the bike to work the provo service the um women's day and even though it was some time ago do we really think Public Works put on the Lakeview Parkway opening event? Or do you think that was done by special events and parks and recreation? I think we probably know. And I think Mary loves all these things and loves to be useful and loves to be a leader in events and putting on a quality presentation for Provo. But by not getting, and she asked for $20,000, that's 0.001% for Mary to have the supplies and be able to convert a seasonal to a part-time. So she's really looking at, you know, looking for a solution there and create that one team approach to where when a request comes in that Mary is completely set up to say yes and let's go do this. And she's not making a choice from saying yes and then watering down another popular event that she has to go with. So that, that was the only one that we did come in because sometimes with our free events, there is not as much of a revenue opportunity. So we came in with a request on that one. So that was one supplemental that I think deserved discussion out of respect for the job that Mary Dunn has done here in Provo City. That's it. Any more discussion? Thank you. Council, uh, police is up next and they are here at the moment. We can probably take five minutes. Your permission. I, uh, I get to sit in on the board meetings and I just, I think that we need, we do need to really appreciate our, our parks and recs department. This is a whole different concept that we are, they have proven themselves in the past and uh, that's one of the reasons I think we can do this is because we trust who you are and what you're doing. So would you please express that to your people that work with you? We appreciate them so much. Thank I will. I'll, I'll carry that forward. I'm I don't glad. see that request on the supplemental. Uh, it's the first one. The mayor's office. 2535. The first one of the
He just went to the mayor's office. About the, it's the next one. Additional part-time media small. service person. Yeah, additional part-time. There we go. One right below that. Additional yeah. event. It's lovely. Additional event. I think based on your presentation, we should grant that. I appreciate that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> Well, any questions for me or staff, or are you guys ready for your break? <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Council, we'll move on to now um, item number three. Cliff, you, you can introduce that one. Yeah, so thank you for taking a few extra minutes for a break, uh, um, uh, Economic Belmont, talk to council members. Um, we asked the police to come and invite human resources to come along. Um, they've said they don't need the full 30 minutes that we allotted them, so we're down to about 15 for them. But um, we asked them to talk about the retention strategy. The, as you know, Council, that there's a number of issues with trying to attract and retain police officers in the competitive environment it is right now. And uh, and then also if they had any issues with their supplementals to, to address that with you. Chief? For uh, letting me spend some time with you today, I appreciate it. Um, so, I will. I'm going to start with the second question first. Um, police supplementals. Um, we had a couple supplementals that weren't uh, funded. However, um, working with um, Captain Grossbauer, Lieutenant Wolken, we're we're able to fund those out of um, just carryover funds from this year. So we're going to be okay with that. So hopefully that'll kind of take care of that question. Are there any questions on that? That had to do with um, primarily you put down pepper ball purchases and then crime reporting software. So how much did you work with those those two items basically? Those are, those are the two items that you have identified on this list. Um, so do you put a conservative estimate of uh, Typically, in the past, we've had somewhere between one hundred and two hundred thousand dollars of payroll savings available for the police department to carry over to take off a few things on this list. The police department has been more aggressive, I think, in addressing some other issues. So, we put a conservative estimate that adds up to about one hundred thousand dollars of current year funding that we could use to, to do it. But I think, from from what I hear from Chief Ferguson, is that I think they're not overly concerned about the things that aren't included as incremental increases in the twenty nineteen budget. And using those savings, they should still be able to meet their highest demand items. And so it's not necessarily exactly how, they, how we're going to spend that, but that's kind of just a, a rough estimate of how much that I think that we'll get at a minimum from, from those payments. So one of those items was um, one time money. The pepper balls were $15,000 one time, but only 9000 of the software was one time. The other 20000 was ongoing. Are they getting a portion of it or are they going to just count so, on? So carryover. using the carryover money is one-time money, and so um, on an ongoing basis, I think that's something that would still need to be addressed in the fiscal 20 budget, but I think it's small enough that the police department can at least handle it for the, for the upcoming fiscal year. But there are, I think, multiple things on that list that, that we would like to be able to take off, but it's just prioritizing new police officers and other equipment needs versus some of those other ongoing, that are, are legitimate needs that the police department has. Um, and it's, it's just prioritizing those funds that we've tried to do it as administration and, and hope that you as a council will feel that we've done that adequately. Um, so moving on, uh, the question is uh, police retention strategy. You know, nationally, there has never been a, a time like this that anybody can recall where we've struggled with re recruitment and retention of police officers. It's a national problem. Um, to address these problems, the command staff and I, um, we're really evaluating things in a completely different light right now. What are we going to have to do? Um, one of the things that we have done um, in the past year is we have created kind of a brand for the police department. And the brand, I will freely admit, I stole from Chief McGill. I loved what he said about it. But this is a destination city. We know that. It's a destination city to bring your family, to bring your business, to, 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 to do everything. 
So why are we not a destination police department? And that is kind of the, the brand that we have chosen to go with, that we are a destination police department. And so in doing so, um, we've identified some things that we are doing to create retention within our ranks. Recruitment, um, you know, we're doing job fairs, we're doing social media posts, we're out there all the time, we're going to police academies and talking, but the retention of our officers is what we seem to be running into problem with right now, retaining that talent that we have here. Um, some of the things that we are doing, we're creating opportunities for professional growth. I came to you a couple of months ago and I asked you for more officers and one of the specific things was to create a traffic unit, a traffic team to address traffic accidents, try to reduce the number of accidents through education and enforcement. Um, we have created a traffic team and so that has created opportunity for a few of our officers. Um, we have other pro professional growth opportunities in our department that a lot of agencies around here just don't have. Um, we equip our officers with what we believe is the very best equipment available. Um, we are in trying to increase our department strength by asking for more officers. And I really appreciate the four that are being considered right now. Um, formalizing a lateral program so that we can attract officers who would maybe like to join our ranks from other agencies. Um, that's something that we've been working with the HR department, specifically with Daniel, about. Um, our facility, bringing, bringing to your attention um, the needs of our facility and the, the work atmosphere over there in the, the quarters to the mayor and the council. Um, training, we, we believe we give the best training possible to our police officers to keep them safe, to keep them up on current trends. Um, um, I am constantly being told by new recruits who have gone through the UBU Academy specifically that one of the biggest reasons they're attracted to Provo is because of the instructors that are there. Well, the primary instructors are there are Provo police officers. So I know that we have a very highly trained police department. Um, positive social media presence. That's, uh, that's everything right now in, in every business, but in police work, it's huge. We have to have our image out there. Um, right down to the littlest things like tweeting if there's a traffic accident that's that's uh, snarling traffic, things that we can do to try to, to, to show our citizens that we're a destination police department, but also to show our own officers that we are doing everything progressive and trying to be on the cutting edge and be out there and doing everything that we should. And then working with HR to create a very, um, I guess you would say an aggressive um, retention plan for, for wages for officers. In the past year, we've lost five officers to other agencies, and those agencies are Spanish Fork, Lehigh, St. George, and Heber City. The talent level of those officers that we have lost uh, include SWAT operators, gang investigators, narcotics investigators, mobile field force people, field training officers, bike patrol officers, school resource officers, arrest control. We put a lot of training into the people that we have lost, is what I'm saying. Um, just the sheer volume of calls that a police officer in Provo takes uh, creates a very well-rounded police officer. They, they know how to do A through Z and we're, we, we're kind of we're losing that to other agencies who are uh, willing to pay more individually for officers right now. Um, the economy is good. Um, we do not have the number of people wishing to become police officers, <clears throat> negative focus on police officers, and, and our profession is keeping a lot of people away. Um, and so what is happening in our culture is uh, agencies are doing more to try to take the talent that's out there, and uh, we've experienced some of that. So the question is, does the current budget reflect our plans? Um, yes and no. Bad answer. It might rain, it might not. But yes and no. Um, yes, in that you know, I came to you and asked for more officers, and it sounds like we're going to be getting more officers, so thank you. Um, yes, in that we have the best equipment available. Um, yes, in that our training and our community support. And, and I want to say this to you, too. Um, several of you came to our police week 
ceremonies last week, um, that was noticed. The officers see that. That's appreciated by, by all of us, so thank you for that. But we do have the community support here. Um, no, in that um, I did lose five officers, and we, we are monitoring this, and we are trying to come up with strategies, working uh, primarily with uh, HR, Daniel, um, to keep us competitive and to keep our talent here. And uh, I, I don't want to become a training ground for other police departments. But yes. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that, there, I mean, in, in academia, there might be some parallels in terms of how salaries work. So I'm, I'm wondering if we are, first of all, competitive at the starting level. Is there any a reason to believe um, even if we are competitive at the starting level and competitive regionally, right, in terms of the places you just identified. Are we also competitive in terms of the overall um, raise brackets that are provided and promotions and so on that can happen? I mean, is there a point at which we become particularly vulnerable when someone says, hey, I've got five years experience or seven years experience with Provo, I can now do A to Z, and now they can pay me 25% more, 30% more without a, without having to move out of state. Yeah. So it seems like, I guess I'm wondering how, do we, do we need a strategy that includes doing exactly what was done to us? And that is sort of, you know, you're talking about hiring, well, you've said that we, you have that strategy, but this, this lateral um, hiring that you're describing, um, are we equipped financially to be able to do that competitively? Do you want to chime in on that, Daniel? From here or from the Up here, there. <laughs> um, that, it's, a, it's a good question. And it is something that we're taking into total consideration right now. That is what we're looking at. Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, the short answer to that is yes, we have looked at that quite extensively. Um, I've come before you to talk about our uh, annual grade study that we do. Generally, when we're looking at city positions, we're going to be looking at ranges. And the market, kind of this invisible hand, kind of then takes over and says, all right, where is this person coming in? And when you're dealing with a classification of one or two or three people, that just sort of plays out. When you're talking about a classification like police officers that have upwards of 100 incumbents, you have to start looking at our actual pay progression practices, making sure that it's competitive and yet fair internally. Um, so there's a lot of things that we look at. So for police officers in particular, um, we look at the top of their range as well. We wanna make sure that at the very end of this, we can be competitive. So as we get experienced officers, they're not going to bolt to another agency. Our turnover is generally not found at that top end. Um, but then we also look at our starting pay. Now our market footprint that we look at is generally the state of Utah. But as Chief pointed out, um, the agencies that we've been losing to are smaller ones around us. And so I look at a couple of market parameters. I look at where are we in the state on our starting pay? And then I look at where we are in the agencies in Utah County and do a comparison on those as well. Uh, the next thing that we do is we look at where we are at five years. So if you take a starting officer and then you look at our natural progression through our ranges, where are we going to be at at five years? Um, where we are compared to other agencies, and we just collected all of this in agency data um, just a couple of months ago from each of them. Uh, competitively, we're actually above our market parameters on where we're at at five years, and there's a couple reasons for that. We have a career series advancement at two years when a police officer goes from a one to a two, and then we have another one at five years where you go from a two to a senior, and there's all sorts of requirements that you have to make, but most of our officers get there. Those are seven and a half percent adjustments. So by the time we're at five years, we're in pretty good shape. Um, then we look at where you are at the actual pay at 10 years. We don't have a career series in that five to 10 year range, and so even though uh, statewide, we're a little bit above market. Locally, we're a little bit below market. And How much so, does it move with? Uh, one point seven percent above statewide, uh, two point six percent below uh, locally. Those people that we lost were what range? What year range? We had officers uh, anywhere from two to 
five years is the group that we're looking at. Wow. And, I'll, and I'll get to that in a second because then you're asking yourself, well, hang on, he just told me that at five years, we're good. You know, compared to how you start and where you end up at five years, uh, statewide, we're actually 5% above where other agencies are. And locally, we're 2.5%. So why did we still lose them? And I think that's a fair question that I'll address in a second. Um, so all this is what we're at right now. Uh, but with that, we lost those people. And so part of the reason why we're losing them still is just like any other business in corporate America, if you have a shortage of talent, and that is appears to be what's happening um, for the reasons that the chief said, uh, maybe a negative perception of police officer, a strong economy where individuals are going elsewhere. If there's a shortage of the talent and these individuals are you know, not being able to replace when they retired the other agencies, they have a, a loss of their most skilled people. So where do they go to get that? They look at the ones who have the experience and they're looking at those in those two to five year ranges. And if you're trying to attract a certain individual, you may pay them above uh, where you would normally bring in someone else. Um, we've seen that happen. Um, so despite our numbers, we still lose those individuals. I don't know what the impact internally to those other organizations. You may have police officers in those other organizations saying, hey, you didn't bring me in at this rate. You're bringing this guy in. I don't know what those are other than to know that according to what they're telling us, we're competitive and yet we still lose them. Um, yes. And I've heard that in the other communities, the workload is a lot lower. Correct. Yeah, and I can't speak for an individual officer of, of what they're looking for in their career. We have officers here I know that would never leave because there's a much more diverse uh, activities that they can do. You may have other officers that hope they never get a call, you know, and uh, they don't have to deal with the other ones. Um, I think that's probably individual. Um, I can speak though, um, Chief and I have had a lot of conversations on this about our officers because of the volume of calls that we get. Um, the skill level of our officers, I would say, is, is right up there with anybody's, if not the best, because you have a lot of call volume, which is not necessarily the primary factor for <clears throat> compensation. What really matters is they can handle all of these different scenarios and they have it more than once a month or three times a year. They have it almost on a daily basis. That is a, a skill level that, um, that, that we need to at least acknowledge. At what point do you burn them out? Well, now you're talking about manpower issues and, and those, are better, those are better answered by the chief. Um, but it's a factor if they feel uh, overworked for some reason, yes. they may want to go. Yes, and, th and that can be true. Uh, in compensation in generally, this is where you start talking about workload and you bring up an excellent point. Um, it doesn't matter what you pay the individual. If it's too much work per shift and you burn them out, it doesn't really matter what you pay. You're still gonna reach that point, um, which is why we typically address workload issues with manpower as opposed to compensation. That's a little bit different of rewarding skill and diversity as opposed to just simple call volume. So, uh, I appreciate all that you're saying here and, and you know, this is important. Um, just one other thought. We, we've talked about workload, we've talked about um, compensation compared goals to people with similar, but as you, as you mentioned, um, if our officers have a really well-rounded skill set and they and they progress in their in their developing these skills faster because of these reasons, um, maybe a, a five-year a police veteran is more on par with an eight-year in, in another in another um, jurisdiction, and so that that may be also one of the reasons why, at, particularly with the shortage, if people are looking to replace. They know they, they were getting a bargain by getting the five-year purple police officer um, because they did, they were just that, that much more advanced to their career by five years. And so if we get, keep getting picked off, you know, at what point do we stop comparing you know, at five levels, at five-year level, and, and look at more at um, the skill set and, and how and as as they are? No, I, I think it's a great point. Uh, the only the devil's advocate on there is each agency is going to have their own arguments of why their officers are better than our officers and what equates 
to, to which. I mean, I've had that in the 20 years that I've done compensation, I've heard that a lot. You know, I can't believe I'm making this when the guy in this other city makes this and he's terrible at his job. So I should be making more. Those are all arguments that have been made. But to your point, I think there's room within our compensation philosophy to address some of that. And, and that's where our philosophy generally is to be plus or minus 5% of whatever market comparison that we're using. And now what, what our market comparisons are could be different. It could be statewide. We could say, let's just look at the local agencies, uh, et cetera. Um, but there are parameters in there that you could say, all right, maybe this is a time, a unique time. I don't want to say unique because we, we do this regularly, but maybe this is a time that we go to the positive aspect of our compensation philosophy and say, all right, we are going to set our salary, our starting pay at plus 5% of the market. Uh, we want to make sure at five years we are plus five. We are at plus five, but maybe we go higher. Uh, that's what makes this not an easy uh discussion because we give two career series within the first five years. So at five years, we look great. Uh, by 10 years, we've sort of come back to that pack. And so there's a whole bunch of things you have to consider. How much more above the market at five years are you willing to go if it means you reach a certain point at 10 years? Or do you separate those out so that they're more evenly spaced? Uh, those are all great questions to the strategy that the chief talked about. He mentioned a lateral program um, where you say, all right, based on our current progression, a five-year officer will be here, a six and a seven will be here, and then we advertise. One of the things that we haven't done in the past is advertise a formal lateral program simply because we haven't had a formal lateral program. But if you advertise it and say, this person's coming in here, we have to address some of the decisions that we've made six, seven years ago. In particular, we did a uh, uh, we froze merit raises for a while. Uh, we also changed our pay structure where instead of 5% raises up front, you got 2.5%. Now, we've tried to combat some of those with other decisions since then. We've raised the amount of our career series from 5% to 7.5%. So there's a little bit back. Our biggest concern when we looked at this is if I'm going to say you're coming in and an eight-year officer will be at here, we'll pay you an eight-year officer, where are our actual eight-year officers? And because of some of those decisions in the past, there's a bit of a lag. And so I've looked at a lot of options to say, all right, if we do a complete lateral in order to be fair and balance out all of these equity issues, how much is that cost to bring all those up? If that's the only thing we change, you're looking at a cost of about $140,000 to do that. If you decide to get aggressive on all aspects and say, we want to start higher, you know, and we want to at five years be higher and 10 years be higher, now you're looking at a cost, if, after you do all of that, now you're looking at a cost of about 500000 because once you reach the top of the range, now you, you can't be too close to a sergeant, you can't be too close to a lieutenant. And so you have to, those changes go all the way up through the top. So, you know, there's a lot of options to look at. There's no easy answers to it, other than the fact that, you know, we have to face the reality of, of, you know, losing officers. George. Lateral option seems to be pretty reasonable. It costs, why would we do that? Well, technically we are within market. Um, and so if it would be outside of market, we're taking a different philosophy to be more aggressive. And, you know, they would have funding for that. One of the questions that was there is, is, is $140,000 to do a lateral program accounted for in the budget? The answer is no. Could be. Correct. Well, that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is, that, is that what we're proposing? Uh, I'm not making that proposal. Um, I'm just saying these are the discussions that we've had. So just wondering, you do uh, exit interviews. So you find out of some reason, perhaps, <coughs> if they are from willing to share, why they are going to another jurisdiction so that we can better address what we are lacking. We do that. Uh, we do the exit interviews, um, but they're not always, um, they don't always give you a clear cut answer. For example, uh, we have an officer who left recently and they're going to another agency. My understanding is that they're making more money, or they possibly could be making more money. Uh, they rated pay, the actual pay in our ranges, as good, good to excellent. And so there may be other reasons why they're going. Um, they're not always conclusive. Certainly some officers, when they leave, they say, I'm going for pay and 
Provo's pay is not comparable. Others who are leaving for pay say Provo's pay is good. They may have other reasons why they're leaving. Are we losing any for, because just simply because of retirements or um, or promotions to other departments? Uh, not promotions, um, because generally um, they don't. Uh, you promote from within for your sergeants uh, and above. Uh, we are losing the five officers that we've spoken to uh, about. They're going to some of these smaller agencies. But in addition to this, and this is a very real problem for the chief as well, is in that last year um, we've had 17 full-time police turnover where they were police officers a year ago and now they're not. Uh, five of those are the other employment to other agencies that we've talked about. Three are related to discipline. Uh, two are for personal reasons. Essentially, they left law enforcement altogether. And seven are retirements. Um, and so when those seven go, seven get promoted up, and then that's seven new officers. Um, as I said, I've been doing this for, for 20 years. Uh, and, you know, throughout that time you hear, you know, we got to do this or we're going to lose officers. I generally don't respond to that. I respond to the data that's in front of me. And there is a turnover that is occurring in the police department that is very real. You're becoming a very much, a much more inexperienced uh, workforce. And as other people get retirement age, uh, when you lose these officers from two to five years, that's a significant concern. What about uh, signing bonuses for, for new officers in other departments? Is that affecting us? Uh, yeah, I mean, that goes back to the previous question is, is if we're good in the market, why are we leaving? Well, in corporate America is the same. You know, you may have a guy who makes equal amount in order to get that guy or female over here, you have to go above the market and they may use things such as signing bonuses. We have heard stories of signing bonuses or moving allowances in order to get people there. And so some of our officers may look at that as, hey, if the pay is equal, but they're gonna give me X amount of dollars to go, you know, it's it's a lateral move plus the extra money. So what if we uh, say you stick around for five years, we'll give you, uh, in addition to your regular pay, any bonus at that fifth year? Um, that's, that's an option. Um, but then the question is, is once the bonus is paid, um, how long do they stay after that? So you'd have to structure it so that there's an incentive to stay to the Another, next one. Yes, right. Right, and that's some of the options that we've talked about as well, um, as saying, you know, maybe there's another career series advancement at 10 years after getting so many, so much experience as a police officer in Provo. Um, so. We, sorry, we uh, structured it that way for uh, an executive director that we didn't want to lose, and it was like, you stick around for the next 10 years then every you know like so many years you get a certain percentage vested of a large amount of money so that if you stick around the whole time you have a real yeah my and uh i don't discount that i, I think the point to be made there is can you structure your pay philosophy to you know sort of incentivize people to stay longer i'm 100 percent for that but I'm also 100% for doing that within the existing pay philosophy that we have for other employees in the city. Um, you know, we have a unique situation with police, um, not just because of what these other agencies are doing, but in general of, you know, the perception towards the, the law enforcement career. I don't believe it's getting the respect that it deserves. And I think that it gets a little bit of a black eye in the news for whatever reasons. And but that's a very real result you know the result is we don't get as as qualified or we don't get as many candidates uh, so i feel like we should structure but in a way that's equitable to all city employees so i'm curious to know um from either of you if there were i mean you you made the request for eight officers um the administration has proposed four with uh with the budget um analyst and I'm wondering if there's more money available. I mean, you know, would the preference be if if we were to um, increase the funding to say keep the same number? I mean, do you need manpower or do you want more uh, and need more um, flexibility with salary? I guess, and I, I'm, so I'm hearing sort of yes and no is, is part of the answer to that. It's a little unclear to me whether or not uh, even if there was a little bit more in the budget to allow for, say, some signing bonuses or whatever else you might need to be flexible and to be competitive, 
um, is that more desirable than another officer? <clears throat> no, um, when I came here a couple of months ago and I asked for more officers, it was to try to get us on a trajectory to 2030. Um, I still need those officers. Um, the four will help, the eight would get us on the right path. Um, the pay is something that uh, was on my radar two months ago, but really has really taken over. Um, and I, uh, so the, the cost to train a new officer, just to, just to bring an officer in, is so significant. Um, the, the SWAT officer I just lost. I mean, I don't know how many dollars I have put into that officer to train him. One chief made a comment to one of our commanders, though, on one of the officers he hired, have you seen his training portfolio? He couldn't believe what he was getting. Um, we gave him an awful lot. So to, to pick one or the other, hard, that's a hard press. Um, I need officers on the street. I need to keep my officers safe. Um, and, and yet I'm also I'm dealing with a really very real dilemma here where um, we have probably some of the most talented officers in the state. So people are going to come after them. Um, and it's something that I, I really feel strongly about being aggressive with right now to keep my staff here. That five-year officer that I lose is, is my future sergeant, my future lieutenant, my future commander. Um, and to have to start over again and again, we're constantly going to be um, in the training phase. So, I mean, you understand that. Um, so it's a hard question for me to answer. Um, I, I have a big dilemma there. You said we need to stay within the structure. <clears throat> I remember being on the council before when parity came up with retirement. And it got very unpopular with the employees because we went outside parity because of the retirement losses. We were losing people because of retirement benefits. Fire gets subsidized, police work. So it appears we might be a person that kind of a crisis interest again that we might have to go outside because of the particular needs of a particular department to say that we need to stay inside the, the total employee structure when we're continually losing our public service officers. I have an issue with that. Um, Do you remember parity? Yes, very yeah. well. <laughs> yes, I remember, I remember parity mm -hmm. and redefining parity and, uh, and all those discussions. And I'm not saying that the city shouldn't do that for a unique situation. Um, I guess my main point is I believe the city should explore all options within the existing structure before right. going to that. Right, okay. I believe, based on, you know, the research that I've done, that there's ways to do that. Um, question here. We, we shouldn't have taken that 15-minute break. Uh, <laughs> next question. This sounds like it's something that we need to do and talk more about. We'll take a couple more questions and then I we do Can I say just one thing really please an answer to that, Mr. Hanley? Um, 20 years ago or so, that question was posed to the police department. I was a younger officer. Do you want more officers or do you want more pay? And we chose more officers. And I don't know that I'm speaking for the lion's share of the officers today, but that was the decision that some of us that are in the room today made back then. We, we need that support on the street. I just wanted to include in that that at the time that decision was made, manpower need was there not only did the city provide that manpower need but they then looked at the compensation package and gave us both you know so it's not the first time in our history that we face those dilemmas and so it's it's something that we should be visiting i do believe that we are still getting qualified candidates for police officers uh, i know we've hired some recently sure. and the chief has been very high on all of them it's a matter of how many you're getting and and one thing and I, I even hate to say this because it almost sounds like doomsdaying and kind of stuff but one of my concerns right now is everybody does their grade studies and market studies based on what everyone's doing as of the spring we're not sure what everyone's doing July 1 uh, the issue with police officers is very real statewide if not nationwide mm -hmm. yeah and so the question of you know being aggressive under our current philosophy may be a moot point in a couple of months um, where now we're because we didn't do anything now we're behind uh, we just don't know necessarily what uh, the chiefs that we've come in contact are holding their cards pretty close to the to the vest as as, as I would expect so you mentioned some high value 
highly trained officers that leave and, and all that investment goes with them. Uh, so when they complete training that is valuable, that, you know, we're investing in them and then they re, uh, have that available, those skills, are, are they having a, an increase in salary that, that is commensurate with that so that we're paying our high value employees a higher value? In some specialty positions, yes, we, we compensate 2.5% for that specialty, like detectives, narcotics, things like that. But it comes back with them when they leave that position and come back to the patrol. They keep that skill set, but they lose that bump in pay. Um, yeah. My, my take on that is also yes. The way the career series is set up, it's we have uh, you come in as an officer one. When you have two years of experience, which means you go through the FTO program, you achieve all of these skills, you qualify to become a police officer too. There's a 2.5% merit raise that you get on your annual review date, plus there's a 7.5% bump associated with meeting those criteria. We do that again at five years. Uh, in order to go from a police officer to, to a senior police officer, you have to have uh, experience on a specialty team. Uh, you have to be able to work independently. You have to get an advanced law officer uh, certification. And so all of those are built in. They're the, basically, they're the justification for the career series itself. And right there. But then we'll, then we, better move on. We, we need recommendations. I would like to have some recommendations come forward. But then, that's what I was going to ask also, but um, I'd, I'd like to get a better sense of kind of the, the relative priority between retention and hiring new officers. So I was just going to close case to you. Like if, if we had enough funding to hire one additional officer, I'd go from four to five. So that's, hundred. What? how much is that? A little over a hundred thousand dollars. Would you rather have that fifth officer or would you rather put that into a lateral uh, program? Is it 50-50 with you, or is it, is it you know, 60 for <laughs> Just trying to get a sense. That's, that's oh. where I'd like you to think about it and get some recommendations. Yeah, yeah. Put you on the spot here. It's kind of tough. Like, but as chief, I don't know if my my officers will be completely upfront with me if they're planning to leave, if they're entertaining other offers until it's too late, and they're, they're doing a background investigation on my officer. Um, but I hear rumors, and I, I've got to keep my my quality officers here. I think they want to stay here. They know they work in one of the premier cities in the United States. Um, they see, hopefully, they hopefully they see the direction we're trying to take our department. Um, but I, but to keep losing them to smaller agencies, um, yeah. So I would say that I would I, I would say the the compensation package versus one. To wrap this up, I feel like you know, we need to stay in our philosophy, we need it, but we also need to be creative um, because I feel like this is a case of being any wise and kind of foolish. We're, 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 we're trying to not increase these expenses, we're trying to keep the expenses in check, but in doing so we're losing this, we're imaging this great value. And, and so hopefully we can figure out something that can um, allow our best officers to, to stay and feel rightly compensated. Real fast commentary. Okay. My sense is we're in a crisis, literally, and we need to do something about it. And it's going to take additional funding, and we need to find a way to find that funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, council members, um, <clears throat> the council office portion of this discussion at the end will be shorter, and administrative services says they're going to be shorter, so we'll make up a little bit of time today. One of the things I want you to think about is, before at the end of the meeting, I'm going to ask you, given some of the discussions we've had, whether or not you want to come back and have another smaller retreat next week on, on an off week, or right now on our... Um, June 5th meeting, right now we could start 11.30 or 12 already, and whether you'd rather come even earlier than that in order to get everything in um, 
for the budget discussions. So think about that as we go through the rest of the day. Um, administrative services, I miss anybody? Administrative services, we've asked them to come and talk to us a little bit more about cybersecurity and also on their supplementals. So I'll start off with supplementals and then uh, Got Josh and Matt here to talk a little bit about fire security. <coughs> this should be pretty quick unless council has some questions. We have four, and one of them, which is the first one on the list, which is the treadmill, that should say funded in 2018 because we feel like we've got, got to have that taken care of. So basically, all four of these on the current recommendation have been funded. And I think I've already talked to the council about our part-time position in the city reporter's office. Does anybody have any questions or want to have any more discussion about that supplemental? Okay, and then uh, and then the office 365 list uh, licenses. If anybody has any questions, uh, Josh or Matt can answer that. So if it's all right, I'm just going to turn the time over to Josh and Matt to talk a little bit about fiber security and then also ask answer any questions for you. Hi, it's great to be for you again. Uh, cybersecurity, obviously, um, there are some topics we can't necessarily go into because obviously specific methods we use to protect city cyber assets uh, should always be done in a closed session so we don't uh, release uh, all of the technical details would allow a hacker to get into our systems. Uh, but today we prepared a quick memo. Uh, we did have a supplemental that did go into uh, the administration. And obviously there's a lot of hard choices out there. We have to decide whether we're going to be putting officers on the street or investing additional cybersecurity in other areas. So the administration did start a, um, an additional investment in cybersecurity to enhance our current cybersecurity posture. So we prepared this memo for you. And we'd ask that feel free to take a quick moment um, it's not very long, and uh, then just ask any questions you have, and we'll answer to the best of our ability. Are these numbers uh, benefit burdened, or are these just straight salary? Um, I don't really recall on those exact numbers. I think they are benefit burdened, are they not? You're talking about the original request? Yes, yeah. the original request. Well, is in the memo, those are contract related expenses. Um, well, at the bottom, if we talk about next steps for actually adding staff, I don't remember if those numbers are benefit burdened. I'm thinking. But that's, they are. Are. that's for what, next year? It, it's future. At some point when we can yeah. afford and maybe we can plant some money trees in Provo and put some additional <laughs> revenue coming in, that'd be pretty good, right? <laughs> Any, any specific questions we can answer or okay then we'll leave it there okay thank you we just made that five minutes we just did <laughs> no, we're waiting for Skipper Pinery to feel with the help to come back at a in a closed session where we can. I'm not exactly sure what to ask right now, where it's appropriate how to ask it. Um, would it be, would you want to meet with this again in another, what we did meet for one time in our closed session? Um, I would love to see, maybe the council would like this to set up a cybersecurity group that actually go into the details of the maybe they three, four, five, I don't know. There's like 15 ways to approach it. But any attention we have at this level on cybersecurity and advancing our threat mitigation strategies is welcome and advised. So, yes, if you guys would like to set up, I don't know if it's a quarterly uh, session with something like maybe there's members on the team that would be part of that as a, as a subcommittee or something like that, that would be uh, definitely. Thank you. 
Thank you. Council, we asked community development to come in and uh, talk about uh, some issues around zoning office staff. Um, of course, we won't get into some specifics potentially, but uh, also we wanted an update on parking. And as you recall, back in April, uh, when they when when Mr. McGinn presented, we talked about a uh, proposal, proposed parking management plan budget of about 264,000. And um, that number in the in the proposed budget has been reduced to essentially a, a staff position and a little bit of supplies money. And so the question that's being asked is, is you know, what is the intention and the plans for parking management going forth, given that um, as of last year, it was, Council adopted a strategic management uh, parking plan. I just want to know where it was going. Those are the issues we asked community development to talk to us about. Okay, which one do you want for? <laughs> <laughs> which is shorter? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about if I start with parking, okay. and then and we'll go from there. The intent with parking, I think, the reason you're seeing that budget reduces one of the things that uh, our consultant or the main thing is that we need to have a person dedicated to. Uh, parking and so you see that still in the budget uh parking issues are important we're, we're pursuing those uh admittedly back in april uh what we had in the budget for these other items uh were frankly just our best guesses at this point of what things could be and so one of the things that we're doing is we want to come in and go slow and then as we have specific proposals that need funding, and we'll do as much as we can without uh, any funding. When we do have a specific proposal, we'll come in and lay that out to the council and show you clearly what the budget is and what we would need and, and where we go from there. Uh, and so I think in April, I told you, you know, one of the questions is we threw some money in, in, one, in, a, in, in some account for notifications, stuff like that. and. You know, admittedly, the answer was, I don't really know what I'm going to do with that. It was just kind of a placeholder. So as we went on, we thought it'd be more appropriate just to come in and, and come to the council uh, with some specific proposals. I do have some uh, monies in our budget that's been a carryover uh, dealing with downtown to help us with some wayfinding things and other issues. Uh, and then there will be some big decisions in the future to make on some parking garages and what do we do with them and where do we go? And uh, honestly, a lot of proposals that we'd have for that or monies that would be budgeted for some type of program. Um, I don't even know if we do that. And that's something that we wanna take a little more of a go slow approach uh, with the council, make sure you're okay with what we're doing in this. And parking is something that we come back in the future to deal with. Uh, on an as-needed basis. And we did the number one recommendation that I remember from that study that we did to cost us a lot, better amount of money. Yes. Was to hire a, a, an individual that would oversee that. The other recommendations, are we still focusing on those? Are, do we still believe in those recommendations from that study? And, uh, and challenge becomes the funding for those that, are we still focused with that? I, th I think we are. I think you've seen around town, we were doing a lot of, uh, of wayfinding. What, one of the things that, that we're doing is, is frankly, uh, have gone in and tried to approach the wayfinding and do it on a much more cost effective basis. So one of the things had included uh, getting a lot of signage and some of that signage was pretty expensive. And we've gone back and, and re-looked at this and retooled it. And so now we're uh, able to uh, just get some vinyl uh, that we can put over existing signs and repurpose those without having to go spend a lot of money on things that we don't really need. That, now, there may be some things in the future following uh, not just our parking, but our wayfinding study that was done that we'll need to come back in for more appropriation. But the, but the parking portion of that, um, we're trying to deal with it on a much more cost-effective basis and refurbishing old signs and using existing things that we have rather than buy anything new. Okay. 
And then if we do need to buy something new, we prefer to come back to the council, tell you what we need to buy that's new, why we're, uh, we're buying it and justify it at that time, and get an appropriation. Crickets, I hear crickets. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> good now. I, I, I would, other conversations are, um, have helped me understand a few things more about the situation and what we're dealing with. And, um, it, well, the direction we're going right now, I get, I kind of get, see the where, where you're going with this personally, and I would invite other council members to make some calls and um, ask some questions around this. And, and parking, I think, is, is a really important issue, and we can't let this this go. This is something we need to keep on. It's it's uh, one of the things I learned from our consultant is when you talk about your downtown and the vitality of your downtown, parking and parking issues and wayfinding along with parking, that's somebody's first and last impression of the city. As they come into our city, that's the first impression they'll have. And when they leave uh, and, and try to now, are, are after they've been here and done whatever it is that they want to do, that's their last impression, is getting in their car and, and then leaving for, for those that drive. And so it's an extremely important thing. Um, the great thing that I think the city has done, which is, uh, kind of a double-edged sword. Our, our consultant really talked about this. He, he Dennis Burns from Kindley Horn, he, he came in and he said, you know, my hat's off to you. You've, you've done a really good thing, which is most communities wait until they're in a crisis mode, absolute crisis mode before they deal with it because parking can be a hard issue to deal with and you're taking a little more proactive approach so you can go a little slower and see what uh, uh, how things work <laughs> out and, and gauge your success as you go along a little better and easier than, than uh, a lot of communities that face a crisis and they just have to do something tomorrow. And then sometimes they, they do the wrong thing rather than really approaching it uh, in a measured fashion. Now, having said that, the downside of that is sometimes it's hard to uh, get a lot of community support for something that's not a crisis yet when we have so many other needs in a budget. And so what we really want to do is be very thoughtful and methodical in our approach and come back to the council frequently, as the council would like us to, about what we're doing and how and where we're going from there. In the future, I know we're going to have some uh, things to talk about with the council about uh, some of the parking garages in town, of which in which the city has an interest, um, either as uh, a manager or a right to some spaces or owning the underlying ground. I prefer your approach of coming back with supplementals rather than putting it in the budget where we really don't know what we need. So thank you for doing it that way. When I saw the budget and didn't see those things, I, I really appreciate taking the separate issues at the time rather than putting it in a budget that's going to be six months away anyway. Yeah, and, and, and standing here right now, I couldn't give you a better time frame than I think in the next six months we may face some of these issues. When did you, when did community development take over parking? Was it, has it always been under first, your? First of the year. First of the year. First of the year. Okay. okay. How does your, your request for a additional office staff, how does that help your? Oh, okay. Yes. It, uh, we've made a supplemental request. <coughs> Excuse me. We've made a supplemental request. Uh, to have a part-time uh, position, uh, office help, office specialist one position, I think that we have, and to make it full-time, um, which would be a few additional hours a week that we could have them up now up to the 40 hours 
um, and, and then provide benefits. And that's one thing with uh, 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 part-time help that we have, we have to be careful about uh, uh, people working more than 25 hours uh, in a given period of time or we have to go back and pay benefits and things like that. So this person uh, is, that's part-time, is currently assigned to the zoning division. And we wanted to upgrade that to make it a full-time position. Um, we do have money that we can have uh, for other part-time uh, monies that can be spent for people to work in the office. Um, our full-time request got taken out of this budget. We can still make it work uh, because we do have budget that we have for part-time. Admittedly, uh, it's, kind of, it's a selfish reason. I guess all budget requests are in, in some sense are selfish reason. Because if I have one full-time person, it's easier for me to deal with uh, internally. Um, there's the less training, less things like that. That's one dedicated person I have in the office 40 hours a week. I can still get the work covered, but I'll have to divide it up into two part-time people to be able to do that. So there is a cost saving to the city. At some point in the future, I would like to uh, see if we can't get that position full time uh, and have the one position. But right now, and knowing all of the priorities that we have uh, in the city uh, that the council's faced with, uh, we felt comfortable uh, being able to handle it with two part-time positions uh, rather than one full-time position. That $40,000 appears to be then mostly benefits. Uh, yeah, mo mostly the benefits and then a little bit extra because uh, the most I can work somebody's to the 25 hours, so about a 15 uh, additional hours a week plus benefits now. So I do have budget to cover the 15 hours, but with part-time work. And part-time work, um, uh, in the past, full-time work has been more stable. I'll tell you, it's, it's interesting right now, the job market. Um, it, it's a bit of a wild card <laughs> for us in, in hiring. Um, it used to be we would uh, advertise for a position and I might have 20, 30 people apply. We now advertise for a position and I might have four or five people apply. And so the hiring market is a little different. Um, and there are some people that just don't want to work full time and a part time schedule uh, fits them. So we feel pretty good uh, about uh, that position. We can still get, I think, we can still get the work covered. We will have some additional work to do with the uh, uh, disclosure and acknowledgement uh, statement. We're finding that uh, people are calling us frequently with questions and there's more uh, paperwork that we need to process. I think we can have it covered adequately though um, and save the benefits money. And that's always that's always the uh, uh, the hard issue to guess at. It's not in the budget. Uh, we didn't request it this year, but I'll, an example of that would be building inspection. Um, the, the construction industry's been heating up again. You've probably seen that in, in the paper. So we have our people, and we're not yet quite there for another full-time position but yet we probably have during the busiest time this year, we'll have more than a, a, enough work for the existing numbers that we have. So, and this is a debate Wayne and I have almost every year, which is, Gary, are you gonna come ask for another person or are we just going to cover a little bit of overtime and deal with it that way rather than another person and benefits and things like that. And at some point, there's a tipping point where you where you need to hire another person. But I don't think we're there yet. And so that's why you don't see that in this budget. Yes. In this budget, I know this last year you had a retirement of a key person and yes. had to do with plan review. Uh -huh. I'm seeing in the industry, a lot of cities are eliminating that plan review process. Yeah. A lot of... Counting that as important as 
plans and the engineers that just come and if it's all there then we don't need to go through it too what is that a concern I, I think you've refilled that position and I'm yes. assuming doing the same piece, the same job yeah so we we and uh, we had a retirement earlier this year and our plans examiner retired and we have uh, filled that position now with an internal candidate um, and they were well qualified and trained. We, we do a lot of cross training to get people up to speed to make sure you never know what's going to happen, who wins the lottery tonight and doesn't show up tomorrow. You know, so we got to have these things covered. Um, a lot of communities on their plan review, they've gone to where they're hiring outside firms, uh, engineering firms that may do it. And, and uh, we still think it's important to do in-house. Um, and, and mostly because in the plans examining, um, it, it's kind of, and we've talked about this before in building inspection, if uh, I, I have a really good national construction firm working on a project and doing stuff, and we have uh, you know world class architects coming in doing the plans, we'll spend less time on that than we will on a mom and pop who are doing their own subdivision and building their own houses by themselves or the weekend warrior who's finishing their basement. We spend more time on that uh, because they don't know what they're doing and there's lots of mistakes. And, and, and the primary thing that we're looking at is to make people safe and make sure that whatever they build is safe and, and, and it, it works that way. And so having our own plans examiner does two main things for us. Uh, first and foremost, in my mind, we have somebody on staff who somebody can call up and say, hey, I'm working on these plans. You know, I need help. And we, you know, especially with kind of that weekend warrior, the, the owner builder, that's really important to have that. And second, it makes the process faster for uh, especially the bigger firms and, and bigger contractors and architects that come in. Um, and we can get through those plans uh, so much faster. Uh, and we think the public's happier with that. And we think the public's safer by doing it the way we're doing it. Um, you mentioned earlier about eating priorities. And absolutely, there's so many priorities. Um, the council reaffirmed at the beginning of the year that, that zoning compliance is, is top on our list. Um, I think years ago we, we staffed up and we were implementing the RDL um, program. Yes. It sounds like there may be you know, that, that, that the compliance rate at that may have fallen off. We we're looking at um, this new process, that's right, this new ordinance with the disclosures and acknowledgements, it, it seems to me like we've got a lot of things going, and, and I think the council felt like we want to get on top of this issue, and I, I think we've, we've I, I probably have said before, you know, that we don't have a great reputation for enforcing our, our zoning, and, and I, I want to make sure that that's clear, that I'm not being critical of our zoning enforcement, I think I'm being more critical of us that we're not putting the resources there that is necessary in order to get on top of the problem. Um, just anecdotally, just based on my observations and the people that I, I, I talk with, which I, I you know, I, I'm, my, my, my view, my perspective is very small in just one part of the city, but I have not, I, I don't feel like we're there yet. I don't feel like um, we're on top of it. I don't, I don't even, I'm not even sure that I feel like we're making progress to the point we can get on top of it. And I'm hoping that these tools, and, and I can be patient, right? you know, when you're putting these tools, you feel like you're going to make this more effective. So I hope once these tools get them in place, then we can start making that move towards getting on top of it. But as of right now, I don't know what the other council members feel, but as of right now, I don't feel like we're making a lot of progress. And, I, and again, I don't think it's because 
we grow the good staff, it's the idle people are putting the resources that we need. Um, so again, I don't know what the other council members feel about about this, but but I, I feel like you know, I, I I'd like to, to at least explore and consider um, staffing up zoning enforcement a little bit as we're biting off on these new initiatives. And once we get on top of it, I think we can scale back down. But but I'm I'm not sure we're we're making the progress that we need to make. I'm not looking for a response necessarily. Oh. It was, it was thrown out there for, for everyone to, to chew on. And uh, I, I I agree that we we may have some uh, extra work to do here, at least for a while. And at least based on some surveys done in the southeast that I'm aware of, that seem to indicate there was quite a few that were operating without RDLs and. We were to get on top of that, it would take manpower to do it. Yeah, and, and we run into that uh, fairly regularly. That, that's an issue is, is properties turn over, people forget, and if we don't know, we don't know that they need an RDL. If, if it's, or if something turns into a rental, you know, there's no automatic way that, that we know that. So when RDL came into being uh, back in, 03 or something like that. We had to gear up and we had quite a few. I think there was eight uh, enforcement officers in addition to Secretary of Health and, and the uh, supervisor over that division. And then we went back down and then last year, the year before, the council gave us two additional, which has been very appreciated, which has helped. And we've been doing uh, some uh, some good things with that. And now in this budget year, in anticipation of the new disclosure and acknowledgement, um, we're so far not anticipating a lot more necessarily work for uh, the officers to do, but probably a lot more paperwork. And that's why we're going to be having, uh, 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 using temporary people uh, to to uh, help us uh, get that increased paperwork taken care of. In the future, we definitely would like to go to um, a full-time position. Um, it, it, and, and again, it's probably because it's more, not because uh, we can't handle the work with the two, but it's a more stable situation for us. And it is an interesting hiring time right now though, um, and have had uh, some difficulty in hiring people. Approximately how many uh, RDL holders are there, and how much are we charging for the lessons? Oh boy. I have, off the top of my head, I think there's, I think in, there's in rentals in the city, I want to say seven, eight thousand rentals now how many individual property owners uh that is you know because some people own multiple rental units um i don't know we can get that information for you i don't have that off the top of my head any kind of an estimate like maybe half that number have rdls or would you say it's well, uh, of the rental properties? Yeah, I'm interested in how many people are actually paying the, the license each year. Oh, yeah, my my guess would be... Um, 3,500? Yeah, and that, that's just, that's just a, 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 a real guess. And it's uh, $20 is the rental dwelling license fee. And it's twenty. Well, let me step back. It, I, it's twenty dollars for no matter how many you you have. Liz, do you remember? I think it's like twenty to sixty. Twenty to sixty. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It, twenty for one and sixty if you have more than one. So you may have a uh, hundred, and you pay sixty. You may have a single family home, and you pay twenty. Have 
those fees changed at all since 2003? Or the, the I don't believe they have. So. so you're wondering if we could pay for staff with fees? But that's yeah, that's where I was going with that. I'm I'm wondering how you know if we've got the right fee structure, if that could potentially help out some of the staffing needs. And particularly if we could increase the percentage of people that are supposed to have them. Don't right now, and that, that would help with that situation as well. I, th I think this uh, uh, letter that you've seen is is going out, uh, and, and a lot of people have gotten it. Some still haven't uh, about the new ordinance, and uh, I think we will soon see. I think we'll see an increase in people coming. In, oh, I need to get a license. I didn't realize that. I. Uh, but we're already getting calls on that. Yeah, we'll tell them that you sent that out to everybody because they'll they'll be more dismissive of it. But if they, how did they know that I needed this letter? <laughs> I I've got one place that I pay sixty dollars for, and the one across the street pays sixty dollars also. Back to new development, the Cowboy Partners pay sixty dollars. Yeah, if one owner owned all of those, they'd pay $60. Make a motion, Jeremy. That's a little interesting, too. <laughs> Year the day, we've collected a little over $5,000 of revenue. Now, when this originally went in, there was a proposal, and it was a per, per unit. Um, and it, I can't remember. There are different ideas kicked around back then with the council. You know, uh, I think they even range from ten dollars or five dollars a unit to you know some uh you know twenty dollars a unit and different things in there and it definitely was a compromise uh as the council looked at it to come up with twenty dollars if you've got one if you have more than one uh the 60. i think the council just wanted to get it passed and i think that's <laughs> So it was and, and at that time, uh, uh, our estimates of it was that it was artificially low, or, or it was lower than the cost recovery would be for it, clearly. Considering what rental properties went for today, we certainly could justify the increase. Uh, and do we have a way to compare with other cities? I think that would be an interesting comparison. Yeah, there are some, there's a, a couple of cities that do uh, rental dwelling licensing the way we do, and then there are other cities that do, what's the name of the uh, good, uh, landlord. good landlord programs. Yeah. Right. And, and so what we're doing is different than a good landlord program. That's something that I'm interested in. Is that, is that something the housing committee would want to take a look at, or is that a, a gaffer or a committee that would fits? Or just find someone on staff that has bandwidth. I mean, it's just largely what are we doing versus what are other people doing? What's reasonable? And then even talking to people like the Utah Apartment Association yeah. and asking them. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm looking at it more of, you know, the, the whole program. What, what's happening? Is it is it every three years there's a uh, inspection or anyway? Just just kind of looking at it. Uh, that's what's allowed, but for a long time it wasn't happening. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we start doing building parliament to do a study on building fees, pairing us to other cities, what's, what's being done, what's the recommendation whether we should increase the fee or not. Particularly if we're not going to cover that but cost. And I like that. That has to also come through them because we can't instruct them, I don't think. But if that's something that the administration would work with us on, I don't know. I certainly, certainly think it would be, it would increase the funding for that program. So I hope the administration would be in favor of it. I think that we, as a council, we can say we would like you to look at that and then let the administration kind of 
help us guide us through this because I think that, that is there. I, I, I just have a hard time directing you from the council. Request. We can request. <laughs> Thank you. That's better. Request. That's better. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. I, and I appreciate that. So that you have our interest in that. And I'd like to second that motion and uh, just really quick back the envelope calculation here. I don't think it would take a whole lot of tweaking to come up with that 40000 a year. How much was it for the supplemental for to go to full time? It's 40000 40, 40, yeah. That would probably get us most of the way, if not all the way there. And, and, and with the council's uh, oversight responsibility, um, we'll start working on uh, putting together the numbers and, and we'll work with finance and licensing of how many licenses we have, uh, what the fees are, how many, you know, all, all of that data that we have. And maybe that would be a good place to start is, is to bring that data of, of what the picture or the snapshot that we already have in our city and bring that to you and then have a discussion about where we go from there. That was my intent uh, because we don't know. Yeah, and, and that's what I thought you meant. It's just as part of the council's super uh, vision of of what's happening in the city, similar to uh, the fees. As you come in, ask us about fees and where we are in fees and and how much our fees are generating and how much time and effort we put into it. Um, I think we could work on something very similar and work with uh, licensing, finance, and the other departments that we need to come back at a future date. It, it will take us a little while to, to put that stuff together. I think that's a great suggestion, and I can look forward to coming back to what that meant. Do we need, yeah, um, those in favor? That's, that's unanimous. And, and the, the, the sooner that you could let me know of a, of a date when that might fit into your schedule will help us arrange how, how we uh, could approach that. Not next week. I, I saw you saw that look on your face. <laughs> well, here's the question for you. Is it possible to have it back before council by June 19th or, or June 5th or June 19th, or, or are we talking summer for a, a full study? <coughs> July 11th and 18th of the next two uh, I think we could come back at the, and I'm assuming that's a council day with the work session. If you wanted to put us on a work session, we could come back and give you, I think, uh, a, a lot of information that we already have. It, it, yeah, whatever we have at that point and tell you, you know, just give you an update or status report on the fifth. Um, I thought it was the nineteenth. Well, that's the that's the last day to adopt the budget, unless we do truth and taxation. So we try and get as if we're going to make a change to the budget, it'd be nice to have it for Dustin. By oh, June Dustin 5th. doesn't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> it could be handled as a as, a, as an appropriation later. I, I, we could come back on the 5th. I just don't know how much, without going back and talking to my this, business analyst, this, <laughs> you know, because she'll be doing a lot of the work to, to help us. We'll let you decide. Okay. Yeah. Let's just communicate on it. And then the other thing we could do is if, if you get to the point where you've got enough information and we can't make the 5th, but you could be ready in the 19th, you could always send a memo to the council. Oh, okay. With some information. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. We'll shoot for the fifth and try and get as much information as we can. I'm with David. It would be nice to find a position. And if there's money there to do it with increasing the fees, that would be nice. Okay. Any more questions for Gary? One thing I love about Gary is that no matter where we are on the count on the schedule, he can bring us back to the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Um, so we asked the administration, We need. They, there were three big things that, that stood out, um, and some of you have, uh, council members have asked about these things, and so we've invited the administration to come and talk to us. Um, there had been a, a proposal to have a sustainability coordinator that wasn't funded. Uh, wanted to talk about that. There was um, last year, as part of our budgeting for outcomes or budgeting for priorities, um, 
priorities. Uh, there was $50,000 funded in the budget towards uh, that effort, and then that money was carried forward. Uh, there's no additional money this time. And in the beginning of the year, if you recall, we started talking about the big idea, but couldn't get wrapped around that. Um, so we just wanted to have a discussion where that is going. And then, as you know, uh, the current fiscal year, the administration uh, implemented in a, a, um, an innovation fund an innovation program that they got started, and we've had reports on, on how that's going. Um, but in light of the, uh, the proposal to have a 1% call on the salary uh, or on the, on the budget, that um, one of the things that was uh, adjusted downward, indeed even cut, was the innovation uh, budget for next year. So we just wanted to have different council members that asked questions about these, as we thought these were three good topics to ask the administration to speak to us about. Is that you or is that someone? Yeah. Well, we're going to ask the guys, I think, to talk about the sustainability uh, effort, and then we'll come back and cover the other items for you. So we did, you know, start with hopes that maybe we would have funding for a full-time sustainability coordinator. We know there's some different views um, on that, but we were we were hopeful, but weren't able to see where that could fit in. But we, we then had the thought, what if we kind of convert the the position that's currently a parking coordinator to being kind of a two function position, not two separate part time positions, but one full time position that would be both parking and sustainability. And it was kind of the best we could come up with. Um, we don't know if it's a super great idea or not, but it's it's maybe a step in the right direction on moving towards sustainability. Um, I guess we also think that it's it's possible that we can keep moving in the right direction with 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 parking without 40 hours a week on it, maybe 20 is, is sufficient if we get the right person. So that's the idea uh, in its essence is, is maybe we try this. We can always, uh, I guess, keep looking at this and, and see where we go next. But that was our idea to, to try to get our a foot in the door, I guess, at least on sustainability. Um, and that, uh, you know, we, we post for it and see if we get a good person who can kind of wear, wear two hats. So. That's the idea for now to try to, to try to kind of do something towards sustainability. I think I could just maybe add to that. I, I, um, I, I know Dave and, and I and, and Don have talked about this already, and, and I think Don Jarvis is uh, very comfortable with this as a as a half time or however the percentage breaks down exactly between the full and, and part time responsibility or division of labor I guess in terms of the full-time position um, but I think it I think it would still allow someone who could apply for grants and to um, be coordinating um, between different agencies in the city in a way that could be really beneficial to the city and, and it's um, it seems to me kind of low risk and potentially higher yield uh, because it's not it's not an additional budget item at this point um, we could give it a we could give it sort of a probationary period to see whether or not uh, you know revisit after a year to see if the combination of the two is working um, and maybe revisit it, it assuming that's the case then revisit after you know, three years to see whether or not the sustainability portion of the job description is actually reaping some benefits for the city that, that are tangible and measurable and so on. Um, anyway, that was, that was my initial reaction. How does, Gary's gone, I'd be interested in hearing his opinion on how that, how that will mesh into his department with the sustainability that has been the past been under the administration's, I mean the mayor's office, now and it's under account if we're putting all that into community development, how do those things mesh? That's a good question. I don't know that I thought through that. I think in a perfect world, if we were to fund a sustainability coordinator, it probably belongs in administrative services, largely because we're talking about building related issues and opportunities like that, applying for grants. Um, I don't think it's a bad fit in community development. It's just probably not ideal. And so, I, as Councilmember Handley suggested, I think there's some value in doing a little ready, fire, aim with sustainability, and let's take a run at it with the dedicating, you know, 20 hours a week on average or thereabouts, 
to it in community development. Let's experiment with it and see how it works. And if we reach the conclusion where we think we need a full-time sustainability coordinator, we would probably fund that position and put it in administrative services. That'd be my guess. But I don't think it's a bad place to start. My concern looking at this, and I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad I understand the pressures, and I'm glad that we figured out something. And so that's uh, what I'm very grateful for that. Um, my concern, and I'm, I don't know if it's unreasonable of me. I'm, I'm really trying to be reasonable and patient and all of that. But I, I feel I feel like I'm losing a little patience. I'm, I'm I uh, I a little bit like zoning um, with parking. I think I wish we were further along uh, than we are now. And so um, you know, I'm hopeful that this is a good step that will take us forward, but I'm also worried that if you know, if we're not getting it done with 40 hours a week, are we going to get it done with 20 hours a week? And, and so I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm supportive. I, I, I like the idea of let's, let's, let's give it a shot, let's do it, but also I'm, I'm getting a little restless. I, I really wish we were further along on the parking than we are. Could I just address that? Because I, I, I don't, I mean, Gary maybe spoke to you a little bit more about that. I thought the impression we had was that Gary didn't feel that the parking position currently was a warranted a full-time responsibility. Is that? I, I do think I've conveyed something along those lines, and I'm not sure I heard it straight from him or where I got that impression, but I, I think we've had the sense that yeah, you could you could do this with with, with less than full time. He's, he's expressed that to me. Okay. That, that was a the first, number one recommendation from our study was full time parking person. So that was. Things as you get older, you get more patient. Words of wisdom. That's why he's always making motions. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> So, my uh, initial reaction is kind of positive that this is worth trying, but it's also, here we have two rather interesting, it's a combination that you don't normally find in an individual, um, someone that's really good at parking, and someone who's good at grant writing, and sustainability, and energy efficiency, or whatever. So it could be a challenge to find somebody that's going to wear both hats and, and kind of deliver on both fronts. But that being said, uh, I'm willing to give it a shot. We, we did talk about that a little bit in terms of the potential skill set. There is there is overlap in terms of, as far as I can tell, both positions or both sets of responsibilities require really good diplomatic skills, communication skills. Um, organizational skills. So I mean, I think there, I think there's enough there that that and, and actually, arguably, a lot of sustainability issues do pertain to parking anyway. I mean, parking is a subset of a larger problem, right? Which like is transportation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, it, it, you could actually end up with somebody who happens to have some sort of traffic engineering background or something. I mean, we were thinking, you know different kinds of engineering backgrounds um, might be especially helpful, but but also the skill sets of your personal skills. Because you're you're in a position where you're not you're not um, you're helping you're helping other organizations function more efficiently and more effectively. So you're almost kind of like an outside consultant to different entities. So if the person doesn't have those skills, they're not they're not going to succeed, period. Um, and if they have them, I would assume that that would be helpful with parking as well. So uh, I, I had a similar concern about the parking. Um, we uh, made that a pretty high priority and, and dedicated a uh, full-time person to it. So I was a little concerned about stepping back from that, but if but if the administration is seeing that maybe that's not um, that level of resources isn't needed, then this makes sense to me as a way to, uh, given all the other resource constraints we have with our police officers, and that maybe this is a 
I feel good about this as a way to ease into the yeah. I think we perceive it as an interim step yeah. to a different and better final solution. So I don't, I don't think we have any illusions that this is going to be the end all be all. I think we've identified what the parking problems are. Mm -hmm. The garages, if we could solve the three garages, we'd be way on the way to be where we need to be. So what we've done right now is just implementing it. So I think a part time position guys actually could do that. Personally. Sustainability, I have real big questions about whether it really is. It's mostly energy. Everything we see is mostly energy, and we have an energy department that can help us there. But I do want to support the administration. That's what they want to do. And I appreciate we are all, we are I've done a lot of things with parking, and there are several things as I talked with Wayne that potentially are very important for a parking person to be involved with in the future. So I think you if you follow the social media buzz, you know there are at least three uh, fairly large parking permit programs that are under consideration by neighborhoods today, and that's. Again, we've had our parking manager trying to coordinate with neighborhood leadership in putting together something that meets the standards for the ordinance and and so on. And so again, that's uh, that's just something that that's another one that could be very consuming for a short period of time. And again, we'll just have to watch it and be careful about how we handle it. Any other questions about that? We'll let you move on to the next budgeting for outcomes and see. We know that. You have done some work on um, citizen committees with budgets, and that's been part of the ongoing discussion. Waiting for that, fill us in. Well, let me let me take a run at, it and I'll certainly the mayor can uh, can add or or correct if I if I misspeak. But um, I think what we have tried to do is listen carefully to what the councils told us about what would make their make a submitted budget from us better fit your process and desires. And so we've worked the last couple of years to try to give you um, more and better information, uh, more detailed information. This year we took a pretty substantial run at performance measures. Um, you know, it's not, not yet where we want it to be, but, uh, but I, think, I think in principle, we've been trying to react to the concerns that you've expressed to us. Um, and so in terms of budgeting for outcomes, I guess, I guess what I'd like to do is have an opportunity at some point to, and I don't know necessarily if I want to press the reset button, but to, but to have a conversation in light of the changes we've made with the budget in the last several years and see if that gets you where you want to be, what's now the delta, what's the next step you'd like us to take, and, and whether that results in a consultant or a staff position, and whether that's in the budget office or the council office or wherever that might land, um, I think we'd, we'd like to kind of take a fresh look and say, okay, here's, here's how far we've come with the budgeting and the reporting processes. Here's what we expect coming out of Provo 360 as we move to the next phase of the project. What, you know, kind of what lack we yet. And, uh, and so I'd, li I'd like to have that discussion, I think, before we'd really weigh in on what to do with the $50,000 that's been allocated in the council's budget. Is the budget committee and now chairman of the budget committee is not without functioning. I think this detail sheets and what you've done on telling me what you've accomplished with the money that you're spending, I'm, I'm happy. I don't particularly, I, I, some people are really happy with me, I don't see a need beyond what you've done personally. Well, and again, I think we'd be happy to have that discussion, whatever you decide to do with the budget. Now, I think we'd like to come back post-budget when we've kind of been through the process and uh, you've, you've kind of as a, as a new assimilated group, to, you know, adopted your first budget, uh, you know, with some with new leadership and council member Handley in place. Let's I, I'd love to have a more thorough discussion about what what you'd like to see happen next and, and how that fifty thousand dollar number might fit into that equation as opposed to doing it the other way around. Wayne, I'm a numbers guy, so so uh, we talk of things being an iterative process. And yes. So uh, if, if we've made good progress, but we want to work together on this, and there, mm -hmm. if there are things that um, 
have actually, I, I would like to think it's paid dividends here. I hope so. It's been That's a big right. investment for us, so we want to make sure it does. Right. So, I mean, not just information for us, uh, but for the public and for uh, in house so that you can sure. better understand uh, how to do better. And so, if, if there's still things that could be done, I mean, I appreciate George being happy, but there's still things that you'd recommend. I'd love to hear it. Okay. I think last year we, as a council, probably understood that budget better than a lot of councils in the past because of some of the things that happened and the information that we started to receive. And I think we came a long way. This is even better this year. Isn't it? It's even better this year. Um, I, but can you help me then? We have a fund that has $50,000 in it. Yeah, it's, it's not budgeted again it's, anymore for this it's, year. It's treated as a carryover, so as long as we don't, as long as, as long as we don't use it, we can carry it over to the next year, which is kind of how we do our uh, legal our legal fund as well. And that carryover would have to be reappropriated because it was set up as a consultant, or any other use of that fund would have to be. Um, so the funds the funds are appropriated as one-time money during the budget process last year for the fiscal 18 budget um, being in the council office I think it's under the direction of the, the council chair and, and and the director of how to spend those monies I mean we have the option of, of not carrying it over if, if the council felt like you didn't know what you wanted to do with it you can drop that to the bottom line and then in the future if you decide that you wanted to appropriate money knowing that you previously had this or we can just carry it over and keep it as a status quo i think those are your two main options um, as far as what to do with that money but, I, I, but it is at the discretion of the council chair but, but i think a year ago we had anticipated that another fifty thousand would be added this year and 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 to in order to provide more funding for that and and um it may Perhaps it was my fault for not raising it as a, as a request. I thought actually it was in the administration budget, and that was my fault for not double checking uh, it being a actual request to the administration for the for the for the budget. The the fact that we can carry over it doesn't concern me because we can carry it over. It was trying to get the other fifty thousand that, that isn't there. But ultimately, the question comes down to. Um, and, and first of all, let me back up. Um, when I go over the intent statements, you'll see that a lot for the last several years as we've asked for incremental changes in the budget process the administration uh, has been very responsive and we've made minor changes every year that have brought us closer and closer and closer to to what we want in, in terms of where we go, want to go um, what we don't have is that position to help us really tag priorities to the budget and which is what we were hoping that the, the budgeting for priorities coordinator would do I'm not fair in carrying it over if we decide to do it. The, my understanding was that we were going to see what the administration wanted to do, and there wasn't a cooperative effort to do that. And that's why I said I'm happy with what's happened so far. I, I would like to have that 50000 to use somewhere else this year. We have a lot of needs. So if we decide to do it, it could be a supplemental. But we're ready to do it, but we're not ready to do it right now. And so I uh, carry it over when we have so many needs to me it seemed like it'd be better if you let it. I, and I agree with George and I struggle with having a chair or a director. It'd have to be going through the whole council, wouldn't it? So it was up to so, you. So I struggle with right that. now it's 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 not there's not additional money added to the budget. So the council if we if we choose not to carry it over, that won't that won't uh, add money for the fiscal nineteen process. There is just a, a, a dollar amount included, like it's an operational expense, like payroll or other um, operational expenses that, that ultimately Cliff and the council chair, I think, are responsible for budget administration of the council offices. It drops to the general funds. So we it would affect the general, general funds. funds, 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 funds yeah, just it's a general fund. I would fund. just assume have to, have, yeah. to have to go back to the general fund rather than have the and then, we can, then we can take it out of the general fund for something we need to get serious budget. Right. And that would take a vote of the yeah. council to do. Right. Yeah. I think I just be, I'm sorry, just be sure it's one time money if it falls to general funds. So you wouldn't you wouldn't want to appropriate it for ongoing expenses, I guess is kind of the bottom line. 
Yeah, that could be. That, <laughs> I know you might want to, but we suggest you not. No, but you're right. You mean, he, we, we appropriated something. All, if, if we appropriated a hundred thousand dollars for a position that we intended to be longer term, it would be ongoing. If we called it that, sure, you'd, you'd have to find it. Find it, find it again the following be, year because it wouldn't be part right, of base budget. Right. If it was year to year, we'd just do one time. But but um, we had talked about that when we actually kick off. Uh, when we do come to the time of, if we do come to the time of actually having a consultant doing that work, that that position probably makes better sense in the administration side because they have the ability to um, oh, direct mayor that kind of ability to direct them. And I definitely think it needs to be on the administration side. Yeah, and right now it's just a holding place for it. Right. So, so I'm thrilled that we're starting to get better metrics out of 360. One. I am, I am tickled with uh, the improvements to our, our budget. It's been wonderful. Um, that said, I, I, I don't think that what we've done is budgeting for outcomes. No, I agree. And so I, I look forward to that okay. um, discussion that you alluded to. Um, but I, I support dropping that into the, to the general fund because I don't think we have a, a, a defined plan and, and I think we need to define our plan and then go back and, and see where the money is. And one thing I would say is that we feel like we have uh, resources and we've been able to do the things that we've done and we would love to have the opportunity that if you can give us more specifics on what you feel like the next step is, our team would love to have a shot at it and see if we can provide that to you. So a question for the council, does anybody, usually what will happen is, is the year end we'll get asked about what do we want to carry over is there anybody on council that does want to carry that money over right now or are you all happy to just drop it, it over? okay I'll say. any further discussion those in favor okay thanks for the clarity um last item was on the innovation fund um so uh, as we've as we've thought about it we may have the opportunity to capture a little money remaining in this fiscal year or next fiscal year by delaying uh, as you know we've we've uh, we've got a position vacant in economic development that's been there for a few months and likely would be a few months more until we have our discussion about retail as sort of the next big thing because we want to we want to we want to utilize that position for the purpose of achieving the retail goals and so we just want to get have a little more discussion around what the outcomes are and what the council would like to see so we know how to kind of program and redefine that position. So we may be able to, while we're in this interim period, um, carry over enough money from this current fiscal year and maybe if we delayed that position a month or two in the next fiscal year, we might be able to cobble together $50,000 to do half an innovation fund in the coming year. Again, those are, they were, um, you know, they were anticipated to become part of the base budget uh, last year. And as they came out in order to fund the COLA, um, we kind of looked back and said, well, what could we do that would get us at least part of the way to, uh, uh, to, a, to an innovation fund, kind of keep a marker in the budget and then be able to consider funding it at the full level the following year. So that's kind of what we're thinking. Again, we would probably do it as a part of the carryover process. Um, and so we'd be doing that, to, you know, in August, September, um, and then try to launch, try to use those dollars to do essentially half of what we did last year with the Innovation Fund. So that's our thinking at this point about it. Um, and we think we can do that within you know, with the existing carryover out of the economic development office and maybe a couple of other spots. So, so again, that's kind of our thinking at this stage about what we do with the innovation fund in the coming year. It seems like money really well spent. I mean, For sure. I, know, I know you can't always argue that every dollar that you spent saved us a dollar or more, yes. but it seemed like in many cases it did, and in other cases where it didn't it improved our services um, yes. in some way and it stimulated, I mean, I, I like it. It's kind of like the spirit of a micro loan, you know, you kind of right. go in and you just inject a little bit of money and you, you stimulate innovation in, in an organization right. and hopefully that sticks, right? Hopefully there's a little bit more of a pattern. Of, yes. Of, uh, yep. So I, I, yep. I'm with you on that one. I think it's just 
it seems like a modest amount and it seems like it, it's a good bang for your buck. Do we direct, if you're trying to pay for it out of carryover, do we direct our $2,000 to carryover that we just talked about rather than going to the general fund? Can we direct it to? That is an option. Yeah, that, that's certainly another option. Yeah. And then, you know, and as we had a presentation from Parks and Rec, we talked about $20,000. That would be, it's not ongoing, but that would fund that for two and a half years, that position. And so those are things that we need to. Well, I intend to make the fifty thousand go back in to fund that twenty thousand three hundred fifty special events. That's what you said. It had to be one time money. Yes, I thought it was to pave my street. Because <laughs> 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 my street. I, I just think it's worthy of the funding. Since we're putting fifty thousand back in, we're taking twenty back out to do that. I don't know if you need a motion to do that or. Uh, you want to have, uh, it, that would, would have been an ongoing thing, and this is only one time money, but it, like I said, it's about two years for that. And that's something that we, I don't know how, I don't know, maybe the, maybe we ought to get a little feedback from the administration on that and say, is that, with all the supplementals, is that priority? It was, it, it's an interest in the council. Well, well, my recommendation is what we do each year. Uh, after we sit as the head advisor to the council is we have a spreadsheet that kind of has some pluses and minuses and then when we when we, that night when you when you finally adopt the budget we give you an accounting for what's changed from what the budget is delivered to you so what i would propose is if, if the council wants us to put some items on that spreadsheet and then we'll look and see if there's some other items that may offset it and then when we get to the end we can see how it works that's what i would recommend rather than Make a decision. Make a decision. Yeah, sure. so, I would think we should put that item on the spreadsheet. Okay. I'd second that. Okay. That's the twenty thousand three fifty for special special events. Okay. If there's any other items that you've heard today, or you want to think about that you want to do something similar, and what we would say is we'll try to come back or look and see, and we can come back and report to you. I think we're going to want to put something on. Please. Right. Yeah, and that's another issue. That's what I agree with you, George. But that's only a one time fifty thousand. That's half a police officer for one year. Well, not, not, not fifty thousand doesn't even start. It doesn't start. Another source of revenue. You're right. I agree with that. So. Okay, Marty, well, Dave Hardy has some ideas. Uh, <laughs> we need to vote on that appropriation. Oh, okay. I, Dave, do you want to do? Well, I'm, I'm sure each of us um, probably have several ideas, ideas of things we'd like to have on the list, but it just seems like we should. Use the same process that the administration uses to rank things. I, I think I prefer to just say here's here's the fifty thousand in one time money and rank it and tell us how you want to use it. That's why it goes back to the spreadsheet. That's where it goes into. That's isn't that what we do? Fifty thousand no, though the preliminary number it's different. No. It's not part of this budget that you're adopting. So the event funding what if if the council's inclined, I would build that into the base budget. That would be affected by balancing the, the general fund. So, in order to fit that in, I'd have to either find revenues or cut an expense somewhere. This amount of money would not affect it. And what we could do is use that money for a one-time um, uh, use. Now, we could choose to one-time fund an ongoing need, um, but our recommendation would be to identify a one-time supplemental request and carry it over for that purpose. If that's but my impression of the special events thing was this was not going to go away. It's Correct. ongoing. It's Correct. ongoing. Which is why we would build an event space. It's getting bigger with time. time. And yeah. There's an issue with bigger. there's an issue with that in that the council's intent statements in the past and part of the budgeting for outcomes and part of the principles of the budget is to not fund ongoing expenses one time. Yeah. Right. Because then so, you put it, then you go back into an unsustainable budget, and it, it may be the first step. But let's consider whether we want to make that step or not. My, my motion was to. Put it into the budget. On the list? On the list. It's already on the list. Now it's a question of whether council wants to to, uh, to prioritize. prioritize it to the top and, and, and fund it. Well, of the things I've heard today that I'm willing to prioritize, that would be something I'd want on the list that we consider. Right. You can't prioritize until we get more on it. It's already on there because when we talked about it, it was 20,535. 20, That's on the supplemental. On the supplemental. 
when you're talking about the different the spec sheet is not the priority list. No, the spec sheet is just a reconciliation of changes to the base budget from the proposed to the final adoption adoption version. And not so this. that's what we it's not this. Include it's the other list, it's the list that, that came from. Okay. okay. So do we, yeah. We're just going to have to be adding, we have to start adding some stuff to that list. So that's just what we'd like to add to see if the council supports it. I'd like to see the innovation fund either on that list or if it's separate because it is one time somehow. You know, anyway, I just, I think the innovation like that funding well. proposed solution is, an, I think, an interim solution that yeah. I think we're not looking at building into the base budget with the mind that we might include that in the base budget for next year. Right. That's right. So it might be appropriate to use that carryover. Mm -hmm. as, as as one, yeah, because yeah. I think our, our preference is to do a one-time solution for that. And so I think that would be ineligible. So right now what we're looking at is we got this 20,355 that the council is really interested in supporting. And so we just we we'll start to your program from a couple weeks ago and talk about looking at some looking at some ways to either cut or increase process and so that's something the council to consider the council staff could look at it we could look at it and then hopefully by the time you know another week or two we'll come back with a recommendation and, and, and we'll make it happen it just needs to be looked at George my experience in business has been when a department does a great job or a business does a great job we order this is just a little reward for I mean, they've done a fantastic job of recreation of parks Reward that effort. They, they, I mean, it's incredible what they've done. That's why I'd like to see on the, the list. I would support George and call for a vote on it because we had a motion on a second to put it on that priority list. No, and that's, that's not the priority. This would be the reconciliation. reconciliation. I would build in, so you're recommending to the administration to build it into the base budget. That's okay. what I see in it. I'm talking about the rec rec reconciliation sheet. Okay, so I'll throw in that. I'm, I'm, since I'm new at this, I'm a little, I mean, I'm, I'm very supportive in spirit of this idea. I just don't know if there are going to be other things that we're also going to think. I mean, sort of maybe going back to Dave's comment, or, um, do we, there will be other things. Well, can we, I mean, is there a reason why we have to decide this particular question right now? I they have that, to know that we want to put it on the reconciliation sheet. It doesn't mean we're passing it at all. It means it's going to be considered. We, we don't have solutions to these yet. I have still have to figure out how to cover these things and including and if we're going to cover the 20, compensation. 20,000. Mm -hmm. Right. But we're still, we would still work through it and come back with a solution to you. We may want to do that on award meeting fifth, specifically to go over how we're proposing to solve these things, what we might include in the final version. And I, and I think it'd be great for even council staff will be looking at the possible ways to cover for this twenty thousand dollars. The thing that the, the message is that's nice about City of Provo is we're not going to print money. We, we're going to have to find a way where we have to take something that's not as important as this that we can pay for. It. And so we're happy to look at it. Council staff can look at it, and we want to come back to you to kind of share with our recommendation. So they will look at it, and I, I appreciate the council staff looking at it also. We look forward to George, you have a motion? We've got a motion on the table. You want to help me understand so that the council members know exactly what we're voting on here? So my understanding is that the council is recommending to the administration to include in the base budget for the proposed, or the final, sorry, the final 2019 budget. Um, the event funding for the parks and recreation fund. The motion is not directing you that it needs to be funded. We're just um, adding it. Recommending that we're adding it to the base budget for the final 2019. To be considered or to be funded? I don't know. Yes. That's, that's, that's 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 I would say to be considered. Because we've got to find yeah. out. We've got to figure out how to do it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. then you come back and say, yeah. My motion is considered. Okay. Then, uh, any other question on it? Those in favor? Okay, that passes unanimously. You do good motions, George. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I ask one, one thing of the administration? 
Yeah. Um, so just just so I'm, I'm clear on, on where you guys are at, you you've come forward with your proposal, yeah. you know, your proposed budget, and the proposed budget did not uh, envision a future taxation, and, and that would be even to you know, an, an, an adjustment that would keep up with inflation. Um, it um, so as as things are, the the tax rate will go down. Will likely almost surely go down this this next season. Um, so, in your position, would if if the council decided, and I'm, is, I'm not saying this is what we would decide, but if we if we discuss and we decide, you know, we want a inflation adjustment or we want to increase it a little bit, to take something, would you oppose that? Would you? welcome that and say well if that's what you want to do we'll support you in that are you I mean, where were you at on we'll that? absolutely consider it <laughs> yeah. how's that <laughs> very good thank you <laughs> and, and we may we may think of the police we may decide that you have five new officers one of them being 40 officers and one staff so staff and so um we may decide as a council you know they need one more you know and then we can do that through to that's how with truth and taxation i really believe if you have a designated reason that's valid that's when you exercise it so i would we would thank you for wayne and isaac as yeah. well but we would definitely consider it if you came said you want to exercise it on behalf of getting another supplying another officer <laughs> or two or two <laughs> thank you very helpful. Thank you. Is there any, anything else for the administration at this time? Do you want me to address the COLA because you had it on the list? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? How much uh, was that item? The COLA? Yeah, the amount. Um, the general fund's <clears throat> impact is $330,000, and there was another $167,000 impact for the rest of the city. And that was so the virtual. 1%. One percent increase, so we're a total of just under five hundred thousand dollars. And when was the last time the cost of living adjustment happened in the city? The we feel like I, it's been a number of years, but I think the market study addresses the cost of living through segments of this the, the employment. So I think it's a difficult question to answer specifically. But, but a cost of living payment probably was pre recession. A true call a true call was probably pre recession. Yes. That was before Mayor Curtis, we did one of the first years we did what we call a call of payment. Just a one, one time. It was given, but it's been since then. Before that time, I bet it's been 10 to 12 years. We could find out if you want it, though. I, I, yeah, my, my only concern is, uh, uh, you know, over time, that's to, that's the almost misleading. Not, not that the intention behind it, the intention behind it is beautiful, but calling it a cost of living adjustment. But it's one percent. It's one and, and that one year after after ten years. Uh, that's well, hardly like do that's hardly an adjustment to cost. Of the CPI index. Money. The CPI index um, going back for pre recession, uh, the merit increases the city has had has have exceeded the cost of living uh, in each of the years since the recession until December of 2016. Beginning in to December of 2016. The, the cost of living index uh, indicates that the, the cost of living has gone up a little bit higher than what the, the merit, merit increases raises. are. So the merit raises were actually functioning essentially as, but the merit raises were not for everybody. Pretty much. Because three, by yeah, definition, they're years, not. Right? Basically right. the philosophy is if, you, if you're not earning yeah. the merit, you probably should be working somewhere else, yeah. right? The idea is that you are continuing to perform at a high level in your jobs. Yeah. I mean, unless you're saying, yeah, we're glad that you're here. You're just not outperforming your your colleagues. But but if you have a merit raise and then you have no cost of living adjustment at all, your your salary is going down over time. Right. I don't know. I'm just I'm just concerned about good people working hard and, yeah. and making less and less money as the years go by. So if you want to go on to YouTube and look for something called, so you think you need a raise. You'll see me, 2004, a, a clip of a council discussion between myself and Steve Curley, and then I'm saying we need a cost of living adjustment, and he's saying, no, they're already paid well enough. 
And so we have a discussion about inflation. And and that's my one thing I ever put on YouTube. <laughs> I am going to look at it. Go ahead, Councilman. I don't want to uh, step you might be about to say this. Okay. To, to me, there, there's multiple ways to make sure people are compensated fairly. And there's, there's and, and Mr. Softly was talking about the, the philosophy or whatever. So one, one way is to say, okay, well, everyone was paid this much last year. This is how much cost of living has gone up. Therefore, we'll do a COLA and, and move everyone and then follow that. Another way is to not look at what the is doing and just say what is the market say is happening and then as inflation goes up the market will respond and we just look across and say well, how much are people of equivalent experience getting paid out on the market I mean what are, are they worth and so and so to me it's it's just different ways to, to get it done and the mayor said hey you know I, I made this commitment let's do it and so I'm hoping that the, the cost of living adjustment is being considered as well in that market study or, or whatever, but my hope is we, we still stay at paying people what their value yeah, is. Yeah, as long as it, it, yeah, as long as what you don't end up with is a situation where it's the people who bounce around from one job to another, or the ones who are making the most money, and the ones who are getting punished are the ones who've stayed with the city twenty years. But because they haven't been bouncing around, they haven't tested their salary on the market on the market enough to. So they're they're often these little sort of suppressed salary pools because they're not they're not facing those same pressures. You see what I'm saying? Market wide. But hopefully yeah, we're adjusting you, that in, in our studies. We are adjusting our study, and we have great benefits. Recently, people are still here because the benefits are. You're know, taking the private sector like these benefits. The other thing we've done is, um, in, in many cases in the public sector, when a government entity gives a COLA, sometimes that's salary, sometimes it's benefits, sometimes it's a combination. And there have been many cases, particularly at state, the state government level, where the COLA has not kept pace with medical inflation. And so we started a number of years ago, John, five or six years ago, started adjusting our HSA or our, the amount we give to employees to utilize for medical coverage by a national medical index. And so from a from a medical insurance perspective, we're doing a COLA every year and have done for years. And then I think our philosophy around the market study is that it eventually works as a COLA because as other entities are doing COLAs and doing adjustments, as we compare with them, anytime we find ourselves out of market, we come in and do a 5% bump for all of those people who are out of market. And our experience has been that eventually it catches up uh, as you go around the city. So, so I think we've had the equivalent of a COLA and, and actually it wasn't until the mayoral campaign that I heard a single employee ask about a COLA, uh, you know, which again doesn't surprise me very much, but because um, it's kind of an opportunity to put mayoral candidates on the line. But, um, but, the, uh, but, but again, we've just, we, the, the, whole, the whole hue and cry for a COLA has largely gone by the wayside in the last number of years because we tried these other strategies that have been more market related. So uh, so again, I think we're, you know, and, and the mayor's committed to take a holistic look at our compensation system and see if that, if what we think has held true. And so we'll be spending some time when we get post budget to take a hard look at what we're doing with compensation generally and seeing if it's a good fit. But I think the call is a very, a very appropriate interim step. And, and again, uh, if, if you were to do colas regularly, your market study would show you consistently being in the market, right? We would never have anybody out of market if we were doing colas like all the other cities were doing. Um, and so again, you 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 pay for it one side or the other, uh, whether you do it as a market study or you do it as a cola. Okay. That's so, helpful. Thank you. I would add one other thing. Uh, it's another reason for our police officers or any of our employees to feel just a little bit better about their job, they're getting this call up. Also, they know they have a mayor who keeps her word. And so I think it's Those a positive important. thing. And we're trying to retain new people. And so I think we're going to Police support have been Well, and I, I, yeah, I wasn't asking a question because I questioned the no, no, no. The, 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 the impulse behind it. I actually yeah. support it. I was just wondering if it was totally not, agree. You know. Yeah, no, and that's and that's fair. It's never enough. 
<laughs> it really That's is. Very you, really want, never you really want to give as much and more as you possibly can. All right. So, council members, the, the last item is, uh, is is for me to address you. And we had budgeted 30 minutes. We have nine. You can do it, but there are 12. Um, depending on which clock you look at. Um, basically, we wanted to just uh, go over in 10 statements going past several years and then uh, ask you about them. But ultimately, uh, the one we wanted to focus on was the, the property tax issue. Um, I will also refer you to the pages 116 through 124 of the of the budget for your reference. When you adopt the budget, one of the things you're asked, you, you included in your in your um, resolution adopting budget, is adopting the budget policies and the financial management policies uh, that go with that. And those this year consolidated in one area for I think the first time. Uh, but from be, one pages 120 or 116 to 124, you'll find all those listed out. Bryce, will you bring up that chart I sent you? So going back to 2011, 2014, and 2015, council considered a total of 23 intent statements. And as we've read through them, one of the things we've recognized is a lot of these have been picked up by the policies uh, over the years, uh, so incrementally. So because we're not gonna have time to necessarily go all over them, um, I'm starting to scroll, I don't have it. This is the first kind of encapsulates uh, the legislative intent. And go back, Bryce. And it really talks about good budget process. Let me bring it to me. Yeah, thank you. I'm going crazy with the mouse over here, it's not working. Okay, so going back to, to this one that, they, that the council did in time for the 2012 budget. It talked about some of the things that we needed, a structurally balanced long-term fiscal plan, adequate public facility uh, capital improvement plans, uh, to do the general plan updates, uh, develop policies to promote the budget as a flexible tool. Uh, it goes on and on and on. The things that the, count, that the administration is doing, that the council is endorsing every year. And what did I do, Bryce? Okay. Uh, then they had some specific objectives. And so I'm just gonna just, show you what they are by, by more mostly by the, the captions on them. Um, they had a specific list of funding priorities that year for 2012 that it wanted to be captured. Um, one of the things was long-term budgeting, do a five-year capital improvement plans and then every year get an annual report on the budgeting cap on long-term forecasting. If you look in the budget, and I can't remember which side of the uh, financial policies, there is actually a table uh, near the back of the budget that shows you the long-term forecast. Just before. Which was? The long-term forecast is on page 150. 150, okay. Um, intent statements, talked about capital improvements. They're doing that. Uh, consolidated fee schedule, um, it's, it's, it's being done every year. And, um, and one of the things that the, we'll get to when we get to the last intent statements, we're actually having our budget outcomes, and that is reviewing the fees and make sure that the fees fit that requirement to, you know, are they covering our costs? Um, or, or, and are they based on market studies and things like that? So that, that's being done. Uh, utility rates, to study prepare a 10-year plan for necessary utility rate increases. And I think you saw earlier that that continues. Um, this is the one that we come back to almost every year as to whether or not to hold a truth and taxation um, hearing and consider. Now, back in 2012, it was it was a significant increase of 16%. And remind me, Wayne, once or twice since 2012, it's actually been done. Um, and every year this comes to us, it has come to us in prior years. And as of a year or two ago, Mayor Curtis discontinued doing it because council never uh, never proceeded to a truth and taxation hearing. So this year, the, the the mayor's budget did not include a truth and taxation hearing, but that's something that we want to know, and as Dave Harding was asking, is that something we want to consider this year? And in terms of long-term intent, do we want to revisit this every year as a matter of process, or do we want to take it off of our intent statements? And we think we could probably clean up these intent statements a little bit more. Sales tax, um, do some more work with the state. I, th I think there must have been some political issues at the time that they were working through. Um, but sales tax is an issue, and it, we talked about the big idea earlier this year, improving our 
retail sales tax was something that um, that we considered as a big idea. Uh, the wrap tax. This again was uh, prior to actually implementing it. We now have it. Bond financing. Uh, talked about tax increment districts and identifying prioritized bond prioritized bond mechanisms. Um, I'm not sure exactly where we are, but we know we do do bonds. Although one of the statements in in, in the, the broader terms was to pay as you go rather than bonding for everything if we can help it. Um, intent statements on economic development, trying to make sure we diversify our retail opportunities. Again, this is also now being captured in our in council's priorities. Number 11, parks and rec funding. I think we saw you know, how well that's doing. Street maintenance, uh, we were addressing. So it seems to me that seven, seven years ago, the council was aware that there were things that needed to be better funded. And the council since then have been, and the administration since then have been, uh, have heard what the council of the day wanted and have been making progress in that regard. Budgeting towards priorities. Is that what we're really saying here? We have we had a bunch of priorities and we've been meeting them. Yeah. Yes. Um, without calling it that, uh, Justice Court was uh, was was a traffic school. I don't know if that was implemented. I imagine it was. I haven't had the pleasure yet, thankfully. Um, <laughs> Did you wait? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always <laughs> <laughs> engineering division. Uh, there were some issues with employees there they had to address. Police department uh, continues to be, you know, a recognition of, of the, the staffing issues is, is an ongoing issue. And I think it's more critical now. Uh, good landlord program was considered as an intent statement. Uh, then transfers. I think it started at 10 and somewhere along the way you moved it to 11. Is that correct? Yeah. The, with the uh, implementation of the road maintenance fee, this was this other component. Of that, which was to get us to the four million dollar annual number, or three and a half million dollar annual number. Okay. Um, more, and then those were also these were also included in there, and I don't know they, they really are, are quality of life, and these seem to fit with the vision 2030, 18, and 19 do. So we try to have really good facilities and parks, and and uh, the, the the administration I think has done, and the council supported, uh, making sure that we have well paid, well qualified, and happy employees. <laughs> Recreation was a, in 2014 was a priority, so there were some issues there. Um, okay, and so these ones in 21, 2015 uh, were essentially then encapsulated in the 2016 version of the, of the council priorities uh, for budgeting for outcomes. A stru structurally ba balanced budget initiative, um, some broad language there, very specific in the priorities. We kept, we kept uh, the, the specific language. General fund capital maintenance funding is something that's in our budgeting for priorities is being done. And the last one is your framework for fee structure evaluation of fees. Again, broader discussion there, but you know, single sentence uh, capture in your in your priorities. So of these, uh, 21, 22, and 23 are, are in your budgeting for priorities uh, section. And then the one section that really comes up every year again is that issue of truth and taxation. And that's a question that I'm gonna ask you to, to consider for next time. Can you scroll back and find that one? Sure, 11. 10. Was it four? There's a later version of that one too that was that we did just a couple of years ago. I think you're right, you can find that. Um, no. Uh, I can't find it. You know what it is, Bryce? Five, maybe? Oops, was that it? There, there you go. Six. Okay. The reason I wanted to see it is number two, review and evaluate the effect of inaction with respect to inflation and property taxes uh, on city revenue. But then, George, you, were, you brought up the fact that with all of our fee increases on utilities, that it has brought money into the general fund. And so you were saying, Hey, we've got revenue coming in from one source. Why do we really need to go after the property tax, right? Three hundred twenty-five thousand four hundred ninety-four dollars from transfers, which is basically because we raised our fees, we raised our revenue from the general fund more than we would raise from the property tax increase for inflation. 
Okay. So those are the things to consider. Do you want, in terms of the longer term intent statements, I think we could recraft these and bring them back later if you wish, uh, for maybe study them with the Council Policy Governance Committee and maybe come back with some intent statements early by December so that they can have them in time for the uh, budget process next year. But I really do think having looked at them, the administration brings us a budget that is capturing the most of this anyway. And so the really question is where do you want to go with, with these? Um, so I'm going to leave that there. What I would like to suggest now is we talked in this meeting about uh, having uh, a presentation or discussion on the Bulldog Boulevard project. Um, we talked about um, so the special events money. We talked about uh, crime reporting software and some other issues with the police department in terms of retention. We talked about uh, community development and, 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 and looking at their, their fees for RDLs and such. And there were some motions passed. Um, are there other areas of the budget that you would like to examine in either a council retreat or at another council meeting before the budget? Goes to public hearing. I, I think this the language there that, that Dave um, Connect was just talking about, number two. I, you know, I my sense is that that's a pretty big issue for the school board in terms of the impact that it's had on them to not to have not made that adjustment. Of course, that's their only source of really. Yeah, and and so I think I think that's something that I would really like to get more information on in terms of measuring what we have done to ourselves by not adjusting, and what would we do for ourselves by adjusting, and and for ourselves, I mean, you know, both in terms of the city and uh, our schools. Um, that's just something that really concerns me. I, sh I think I shared this article with some of you quite a while ago, but it was, and I haven't followed up on this, but this was in Sandy, the mayor race in Sandy. Um, the young, it was a young mayor who defeated a 24 year incumbent. And the, the, the city had just gotten so fed up with the fact that it was turning, it was, pre it, there was so much pressure on retail to provide revenue for the city that the city had lost its character. You know, people just felt like it, it didn't feel like a, a neighborhood city anymore. It didn't feel like it was a residential place. It was just this big commercial cash cow. And the, the mayor who had d defeated the previous mayor was sort of making this argument that, that um, the previous administration for, for two, two plus decades had just never touched the property tax according to inflation and that, that that was something he knew was maybe not necessarily the most popular thing to do because it was i mean legally defined as a tax increase even though i think i wonder if going back to what the mayor was saying earlier if you specifically identify a need in the city and you say this is something that we can do for our schools with this adjustment and this is something we can also do for the city with this adjustment but I, I don't I don't know how to make that I don't know how to get to that conclusion without some very specific numbers and very specific ideas. I'm not saying I know going ahead of, ahead of time what what to do about that. I just think it that's what the useful. schools did. Now it's up to us to do it for us because the schools did just what you said last year. They did that last year. They, they control their own tax rate. Yeah. yeah, we don't do anything with that, of course. They're on the opposite year. Okay. Yeah, they raised theirs. It was like, Every, it was, yeah. like $100 was, per average home, and, and we were toying with doing maybe a dollar, and we decided okay. not to. But I would just point out that we're different than other cities where when you raise the property tax on property owners, you're only raising it on half of the property in, in pro because there's so much tax on that property. property. Yeah. John, they just told me we'd have to raise our taxes seventy seven point four percent to make up what we get in transfer. Clarification on that. 
when you say what we did with transfer, does that mean the 300? Yeah, that was my question was what that number means. Is it the amount of additional revenue you got from raising utility rates? Or is it more like a net effect of the change to the utility revenues? Energy's actually went down, um, the other utilities went up. So the net effect is over $30,000. So in order to generate that much from the general funds portion of the property tax revenue require over 7% property tax increase. So that would be the equivalent of roughly adjusting for inflation for maybe three or four years or something like that. Yeah, well, about 3.5% last year. Yeah, so inflation, <coughs> inflation <coughs> it, it depends if we went with the intent yeah. statement that we that the council passed a couple of years ago, I think it was to match it to the West region CPI. West Region CPI for the last year is about three percent. I think that's pretty typical between three and three and a half percent for the last few years. You compound that over the time frame. We did some analysis, I think, during the last year that Mayor Curtis proposed the property tax increase on where we would have been had we been doing these adjustments. There was a pretty significant delta there. We can update that information and provide it to you if, if the council were interested. Um, but but if there I think this is wouldn't make up for that lost ground. Come back and, and do a little bit of a study and bring some information to you. George? Okay. I think it's an extenuating circumstances here also. We might be going to the public for a bond, a special project. Right. Might not be needing to do a truth of taxation. Maybe we can get a little clarification before on that before we start to Maybe. It's, it's some real challenges going forward. I agree. We we have two things that we could possibly be going for. Who knows? Maybe more. <laughs> so back to my question: Is there any? Is there any uh, besides uh, possibly proper tax or not? Is there any other issues you'd like to have come back to a to another meeting, budget related? I'd like to throw in one more. I don't know. I don't know if this needs more meeting or what, but I. Could, um, the, the police issue seems like it needs more conversation. Is that already on the list? It's, it's already on my list. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just just how to make them more competitive, with retaining people, whether or not we want to fund four or more officers. The those, issues that we we discussed. Yeah. Those issues. Need to be Wayne or the mayor, do you have any? Is there any departments uh, or programs or issues that we haven't raised so far that you'd like to address? I think so. <clears throat> okay. So that brings us to uh, whether or not you want to try and have another meeting uh, as early as next week. Right now, the fifth uh, work meeting is 11.30 or 12, depending on what we include already before we add any of this stuff. So we, we could reduce this to, say, 10 o'clock and start make it almost a whole day thing. Um, and remember, you've got a long evening, so you might not want to do that. Um, do you want to come back on the 29th? Do you want to slip something in on the 12th of June? I'll start. I prefer bringing it together. It's Early? More meetings are very exciting for me. Okay. Oh, you'd rather do it on a longer day? I would. I'll take the time off work. I just assume. Do, you know do it once. Do that day as a day on the day. Yeah. 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 Access I'm gone on the 5th, but I also happen to be gone next week, so I was assuming we're not meeting next week. Um, it, uh, anyway, both are work related. Are you your vote on this, then? Uh, what's that? <laughs> you nullifying your vote? Yeah, next week. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying different. It doesn't really make a difference to me. Okay. I, would, I would feel badly missing two meetings if I'm only going to miss. Let, let us look at it then and bring it up to yeah. leadership as to what we think. The tenth, the the fifth would look like, and see if we can streamline things. Try to make it as short as possible. It's, we always do. But my boss with that and the staff is really good at that. It's those breaks that get us. Okay. Um, Dixon's happy though. <laughs> we will. We will take. We will. If there's no objection. We will adjourn by consent. Thank you.